I know it's an early morning. Um, we just kind of wanted to make a day of education and horse racing for Indiana, um, our Indiana horsemen and owners. So it's an exciting day. It's a sunny day. And for those of us that have been here <laughs> this week, it's a very good thing. Uh, my name is Megan Arsman. If I haven't met you before, I am the new communications coordinator for the Indiana Horse Racing Commission and the Thoroughbred Breed Development Program. I started on in February. Um, Jessica Barnes, our director of racing and breed development, is here as well, and we'll have some other um, we'll have some other representatives from the commission coming in a little bit later. Uh, just brief history on myself: I grew up here in Indiana, and then I decided to move all across the country. I'm uh, working at the American Quarter Horse Association publications. I've worked at the National Rain Horse Association and then Blood Horse Publications in Lexington, and then I eventually moved back here two years ago after having my daughter and my husband got a job in Avon. So um, I grew up watching horse racing, been in the industry for quite a few years now. I am a freelance writer on the side, do a little bit of social media marketing, work for advertising agencies and that kind of thing. I felt that it was important for our thoroughbred owners and farm owners to really learn how they can best promote themselves and promote their stallions and their horses. We know if you're, a, if you're participating in the Indiana program, we already know how lucrative and how wonderful our program is. Unfortunately, not very many outs people outside of Indiana or the region understand it or know how lucrative it is. And as the commission, we're working to increase that awareness and increase our visibility across the country and we want to help you guys learn how you can increase your awareness and your visibility as well and increase your business and get your horses and your farms names out there and I wanted to be able to give you the tools to do that so in doing so I put together this seminar I invited four of some of the top people that I think really know their stuff and really understand all the aspects of marketing when it comes to not only print advertising, but digital advertising, social media, public relations, doing all those types of things. There's so much that goes into marketing and advertising than just buying an ad and placing it in the magazine. <coughs> so I'm going to introduce our presenters real quick. Dennis Blake. Um, he, is, he has worked in the horse racing industry since the age of 18 when he started as a teller at Canterbury Park in Minnesota. He previously worked for the American Quarter Horse Association and Texas Thoroughbred Association, and he's currently the editor and publisher of American Racehorse Magazine, which covers thoroughbred racing and breeding in the Midwest and Southwest. He is also the editor of the Horseman's Journal, the official publication of the National Horseman's Benevolent and Protective Association. And he has owned a few racehorses over the years, and one of his first winners was at Hoosier Park back when we were racing the thoroughbreds at Hoosier Park. So I want to welcome Dennis and thank him. American Racehorse also is a sponsor of the seminar. They provided the breakfast and everything, so we want to thank them and thank Dennis for coming out here from Texas. <laughs> Chad Mendel is the founder and CEO of Equisene, your digital marketing partner, a digital marketing agency specializing in strategic internet marketing consulting services including content marketing, influencer marketing, organic and paid search marketing, organic and paid social media, online PR, email and convert conversion optimization. Chad has worked with some of the top brands including Campbell Soup, Pfizer Animal Health, Rood and Riddle Equine Hospital, Kentucky Equine Research, 1K Helmets USA, Mountain Horse USA, Road to the Horse, Martin Collins Equine Services, Thin Line, and many more. Before starting Equisine, he was the executive editor of The Horse, Your Guide to Equine Healthcare, and TheHorse.com at Blood Horse Publications. There, he developed an array of online educational products from videos, newsletters, and live webinars. He also worked with companies and marketing agencies to best position their brands with educational content. In addition to running the marketing business, Chad also owns and operates a 48-acre boarding and breeding farm just outside of Lexington. In addition to boarding horses for outside clients, he and his wife breed, train, and market and sell reigning horses. So thank you very much, Chad. 
Jen Reutz is the co-owner of Topline Communications, a Lexington-based marketing agency whose client list includes several farms, sales agencies, and other thoroughbred industry businesses. Jen has also worked on both sides of the camera, including as a segment producer for the Breeders' Cup and the Kentucky Derby International Feeds, the regional Emmy Award-nominated Unsung Hero, The Horse in the Civil War, and the popular U.S. Equestrian Federation's Learning Center Educational Series and as on-camera talent for the NBC affiliate WLEX in the 14-part HRTV series Victory Lap during the 2010 World Equestrian Games that were held in Lexington, Kentucky. As a freelance writer, her work has been published in and on ESPN.com, Practical Horseman Magazine, Thoroughbred Daily News, The Pollock Report, among others. Originally from Cleveland, Ohio, Jen earned her undergraduate degree in communications from Moorhead State University, galloping at the track each morning before class to pay for her school expenses. And she also earned her master's in marketing from the University of Louisville. She serves on the boards of the Make-A-Wisha Foundation, no, Retired Racehorse <laughs> Project, and the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance Advisory Board. She competes on her two off-track thoroughbreds on the regional hunter jumper show circuits. Thank you, Jen. Vance Hansen is the associate editor and has been with Twin Spires and Brisnet as an editor and handicapper since 2008, covering major events such as the Kentucky Derby, Preakness Stakes, Breeders' Cup, and the Hong Kong International Races. Prior to his time with Twin Spires, he was a handicapper with the Daily Racing Forum for more than eight years and worked as a publicity assistant for two seasons at Canterbury Park in Minnesota. Vance is a member of the National Turf Riders and Broadcasters Association and a graduate of the University of Louisville Equine Industry Program. <coughs> so I just want to thank them for coming up. They all arrived right early this morning um, from Kentucky and from Texas. So we are going to start first with Mr. Dennis Blake and we're going to talk a little bit <coughs> about, ad about advertising and kind of just, you know, the best practices and how to aim your ads. So Dennis? All right, thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here. It was, uh, I think, 102 when I left <laughs> Texas, so I, I might just stay up here till September. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about advertising, but before, I just wanted to thank Megan for putting this together and the, the Racing Commission for thinking to do this. Um, I don't know that any other commission has ever done something like this. Um, and with, with the magazine I do, we cover 12 or 13 states in the uh, Midwest and Southwest and so I deal with just about every state you know from Minnesota all the way down to Texas and there's varying degrees of commissions and racetracks and, and horsemen and honestly in Indiana you guys have really good um, all three of those aspects you know you have a very good and active commission you've got a great racetrack here obviously and then the horsemen's associations here are very active, very uh, good at what they do. You know, the, the owners' association, the, the breeders, the trainers. Um, and obviously, you guys have good purses here, which, which helps. But having all three of those aspects work together is something that you don't see in a lot of states. I, I know you don't see it in Texas, unfortunately, where, where I'm based out of. Um, so that's really a positive aspect that you guys have. And, and I'm really happy that the commission is, is doing this because there's a lot of people that don't know how good things are here in, in Indiana, and it's kind of your job to let people know that, both within Indiana and then outside of Indiana, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit. But if you're here, um, you obviously know that advertising and marketing is something you probably need to, um, to look at doing. And, and just by doing that and, and showing up for this, you're ahead of most of the people in the industry because there's a lot of people that uh, don't think you really need to advertise and, and that may be true for a select few but for most people it, it's it's not um, you really do need to advertise um, and the, the obvious reason is so people know about your business and people want to do business with if you have a stallion farm a training center whatever your business is but there's a couple other reasons too um, I imagine none of you like dealing with the IRS I don't. Um, one of the, the benefits of advertising is that um, w when it comes to the IRS, one of the problems the horse racing industry has, and, and it's not unique to horse racing, but anything that's kind of non-traditional, the IRS sometimes will question whether or not you're operating 
as a business or if you're just doing this as a hobby and, and looking for a way to write off losses for your taxes. And like I said, it's not just for horse racing. It's anything that's not traditional. If, if you have a hardware store, it's easy. You can show the, I mean, the IRS would never even question that, but you have a cash register, you have inventory, you have a store. It's a little different if you have a, a stallion or a, you know, any kind of horse related business, the IRS might question whether or not you're truly doing it as a business. Um, and there's a lot that goes into that. You have to have a business plan, um, you know, keep records, obviously, things like that. But advertising is one of the things that can help you prove that you are operating as a business. And, and you don't have to spend a lot of money. You could spend a couple hundred dollars a year. Um, but if it ever comes down to it where the IRS is saying this is not a business, it helps a lot that you can pull out an ad and say, look, this is the ad I ran on such and such date. I paid, you know, $100 for it, whatever it was. That's just uh, something in your corner that you can use to convince them that you really are operating as a business, along with all that other stuff. It, you know, you need more than just advertising, but it, it definitely will help if you ever get um, audited or, or just even questioned by the IRS. And, and the more information you have in your defense, the shorter that meeting is going to be and the less you'll have to deal with the IRS, which I assume is what you all uh, would want. Um, one of the other reasons, um, and I, get, I run into this sometimes with the magazine I do, people think they don't need to advertise because everyone already knows about them. Um, even if you're the leading stallion farm or the leading training center, everyone in your particular state and in your particular little niche might know about you. Um, but there's a lot of people that don't, especially out of state. Um, I'm in Texas, and I can tell you honestly, very few people in Texas know about what's going on in Indiana, or for that matter, most of the other racing states. And Texas is not unique um, from some of the other states that aren't doing all that well. And there's people in Texas that maybe are not looking to move out of Texas, but have mares that they'd like to send somewhere else. They'd like to diversify a little bit because maybe they have 20 mares in Texas. They want to keep 10 there and have some Texas breads, but they know that that's not maybe the most profitable business right now. So they want to send 10 mares somewhere else. Um, and one of the things that happened about 10 or 15 years ago when Louisiana started to take off, they got uh, video poker and then got uh, slot machines not too long after that. They did an amazing job of, I don't want to say poaching, but it kind of was, um, mares and stallions and horsemen from Texas. Um, they, their breed association did a great job. The stallion owners um, and the farms did a very good job of explaining to people in Texas um, you know, what their program was about, how much money there was out there, how uh, their breed back rule worked and all that and for five or six years there you could see a uh, direct correlation that Texas used to be easily the king of the southwest. They had more mares, more stallions, more foals every year. That's not the case anymore and you could see it when Texas started to go down and Louisiana started going up. You could look at the jockey club numbers and Louisiana would go up by 200 mares, Texas would go down by 200. It was for a few years it was kind of scary. It was just an exact correlation, and I'm sure there was other things in there too, but it was, um, it's amazing how fast some of these state programs can grow, and Indiana has done that. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of people that don't know that, um, especially outside of Indiana. So the more you can do to let people know about that, um, that's only to your benefit. Um, and you may ask, you know, do I really need to advertise? you don't need to spend a lot of money. Um, and, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about some free advertising ways coming up with press releases and, and things like that. Um, but I really think you need to do at least a little bit of, of paid advertising. One of the other benefits of it is if you don't have a website or Facebook, even if you just run one or two ads um, with a, a magazine or a, any of those horse publications, you'd be amazed how much that shows up online too. Um, and I'm not trying to promote my own stuff here, but we've got a stallion register and most of the stallion register, most of the stallions in there are, you know, fairly well known. They're going to be on Blood Horse. They have their own uh, farm websites and stuff like that. 
but there's a few that are um, a little more obscure. And honestly, there's a couple of them that if you search their name, the only thing that really shows up is the page that they have on our website. Um, and if, if they didn't have that, they would be almost uh, invisible. And you'd be surprised how uh, lazy some people are when it comes to internet research. Um, if somebody's looking for a, a Stormcat stallion in Indiana, I know there's three or four here, uh, may, maybe even more, but uh, if someone Googles, you know, Stormcat stallion in Indiana, if you have one and he's not showing up in the Google search, um, you're probably not going to get that phone call. Um, people don't do as much research as maybe we'd like to think that, that they do or that they should do. And whatever is easiest for them to find, they're going to call that, that farm who has uh, a Stormcat stallion that's easy to find. They're not going to go, well, you know, there might be a couple that I don't know about. Um, some people will, but most won't. And so you're really missing out if you don't have some kind of exposure out there for people to find and for people to find relatively uh, easily. Um, when it comes to actually placing the ad, um, that can be kind of intimidating, especially if you've never done it before. And honestly, I can tell you, if you call up not just my magazine, if you call up Blood Horse, any other horse uh, racing website or publication and tell them you've never really advertised and you're interested, they will be thrilled that you're calling them. <laughs> they will do whatever they can to help you out. If you don't know the first thing about putting an ad together, 99% of them will be happy to help you. I can tell you that Blood Horse is, is great at that. Um, I like to think that we're pretty good at, at doing that too because um, we work with a lot of new advertisers and we're happy to help anybody um, even if you don't advertise it if you just have questions um, and are do you have a question which, which magazine was it that you did? Uh, American, Racehorse. American Racehorse yeah and there's copies up there too it's um, yeah I read that one. Oh, okay great <laughs> thank you <laughs> um, but like I, like I said the blood horse my magazine anybody else they're going to be more than happy to help you to answer any questions. So don't feel like you have to know what you're doing. Um, Blood Horse and, and, and my magazine, to a lesser extent, sometimes they deal with very professional ad agencies based out of Lexington. But then we also deal with people who have never advertised at all. And um, we're happy to kind of walk you through the process and, uh, and help you out. One of the things I do want to really stress, and I know we're going to talk about this a little bit too, is please get some good photos. Um, I can't stress how important that is for advertising. Um, I get all kinds of ads coming in that um, sometimes the advertiser has created it, sometimes we create it. And the first thing I'll ask if we're doing it is, you know, send me a couple photos that, that you want to use. And I get some really good photos and I get some that are really scary. Um, I get some that almost, uh, I think they're, testing me um, <laughs> because they're just almost intentionally bad and I'm like you know why did you put the broken down tractor right behind the horse that you're taking a photo of and you don't have to be a, a professional photographer you but you can find one um, and it, that's just part of the advertising expense it doesn't have to cost a lot but it really makes a huge difference if you can get some decent photos of either your horses or the facility or you know your training center whatever you're trying to to highlight photos make a huge difference because if you took Curlin and put him in an unmowed field and put a broken down tractor and took the picture directly into the sun people are going to look at that and go oh, yeah I don't want to breed to that horse <laughs> um, and and then there's other times I've seen horses that are you know nice stallions but nothing spectacular but if you get a good photo it really does make a difference um, and it'll get people to look at the ad they may not look at the photo and go oh yeah I need to load up my mare and, and go over there right now but they're gonna at least give your ad a chance and that's really all that you're looking for um, people ask me you know how do I know if the advertising is working honestly a lot of times you won't <laughs> um, and I know that's that's hard to say when you're you're spending money on it but it's you know, if you're selling a book, it's easy enough. You look, see how many books you've sold. 
if you're trying to advertise your stallion um, or your breeding farm, your training center, wh whatever it is, it's a little more difficult to know exactly how well it's working because really all you're doing with that type of advertising is, is trying to get the first step going. No one's going to look at your ad for a stallion and just call you up and say, okay, I'm, I'm on my way uh, with a mare. What they're going to do is they're going to be interested in your stallion or your farm. They're going to go to your website. They're going to give you a call. They're going to do some research online. So that's really all you're trying to do with this first, uh, with an ad, is to get that foot in the door, get things going. And then after that, it's kind of on you to, uh, you know, to close the deal and, and, and get, get those people interested once they've taken that first step to, uh, to contact you. And I know nobody wants to spend a lot of money on advertising. Everybody's budget is tight. Um, there are a couple easy things you can do to, um, to save some money. Um, I've had some advertisers who will team up with similar but different businesses um, and, and they'll get a bigger ad, they'll get a little better um, a little better rate, they'll get a little more bang for their money. If you're a, a stallion farm and you have a, a training center nearby, see if they want to do an ad together. Um, if you have a, a horse transport company that you do a lot of business with, see if they want to be involved in the ad. There's a lot of things you can do to kind of uh, combine two, even three things in an ad and uh, saves you a little bit of money and, and I think it sometimes makes the ad a little more attractive too because you're kind of appealing to uh, two or three different segments. Um, so that's something to look at. The other thing, and, and I hesitate to say this because it hurts my bottom line a little bit, but ad rates are very negotiable. Um, just like anything else, if you have a stallion and you're standing them for 2500 somebody's going to try to get that number down. Um, and it's the same thing with, with advertising. Don't be afraid to talk to the, the website, the magazine, whatever it is, and tell them, you know, hey, I'm just kind of getting started at this. Can you give me some kind of discount or incentive? And most of the time, um, they'll be able to, to try to work something out with you. Um, you know, don't ask for 50% off or anything like that, but they, they will definitely work with you because like I said, uh, when a new advertiser calls in to a business, that doesn't happen all that often. So when it does, you know, they're going to want to talk to you. They're going to want to try to work, uh, work something out. You could also, you know, don't be afraid to try to offer something unique, um, maybe some kind of ad trade with them. Um, and I haven't done this a whole lot, but if, say, you have a, a vet clinic and, and you have a waiting room or an office, tell them, you know, hey, send me some extra magazines and, and we'll put them out. Um, you know, I'm not going to give you a 50% discount for that, but um, that may, uh, you know, entice the, uh, the magazine to uh, give you a little bit of a, a discount, you know, because it's a two-way thing. The, the, the more that you're helping the magazine um, or the, the website, whatever it is, then the more willing they're going to be uh, to help you out. Um, the last thing I want to say, I was talking about how important photos are. The other thing is please get a logo. Um, that's very important too and it's not expensive. You can get, if you don't have a logo or if you have some terrible hand-drawn logo that was done 20 years ago, you can go online. Um, there's websites you can do it for, for free. I, I don't know if I'd really recommend that because if you don't have the, the ability to do it then it's probably not going to turn out great. But there's plenty of websites or, or local designers, people even on Craigslist, can do a, a nice logo for $100, $200, um, and that's something you can use for 10, 20 years. So it's really a, a small investment, but it makes your brand memorable. It makes people recognize um, your, comp your, your name, whatever it is that, uh, you know, if you want to use your initials, your farm name. Um, it just really helps to have a logo, and then you can do these cool little logo items. Um, we do these and I give them out at sales and I don't think anybody advertises with the magazine because of these. It's just a stupid little squishy horse. But every sale I go to, because um, I've been doing this for two or three years now with these things, people ask me, do you have any more of these? And the thing that helps me is that they have to come up and talk to me and I can ask them, you know, hey, how are your stallions doing? Um, you know, what's going on with your business? And 
99% of the time, it doesn't lead to a direct ad. Um, but if it does 1% of the time, then I'm still ahead of the game. Same with all this other stuff. I have, uh, you can do pens really cheap. We do these pens that light up. People love these. And again, it's not something nobody is going to advertise. Nobody's going to breed to your stallion because of this. But it gets them thinking about it. It gets them calling you up. We do uh, fortune cookies that do not ship well, <laughs> uh, unless you like fortune cookie pieces. But these, I think, were 10 cents each. So there's a sale coming up in, in Texas that I'll bring two or 300 of these. Uh, it'll cost me 20 or 30 bucks. That's nothing. And there's a good chance, you know, maybe I get one ad. Maybe I get even just a subscription out of it. Um, it's, it's something that's easy to do. There's websites you will be amazed. Once you have a good logo, you can go to some of these logo item websites. There is millions of things you can get. Anything you want to put your logo on, you can, and it's, it's pretty cheap. Um, and it'll really help get your name out there. And, and like I said, it's not going to sell anything directly, but it gets people thinking about you. It'll get people to maybe call you up or come talk to you. And, and that's really all you can ask for for an ad is to get things going. Um, that gives you the chance to tell your story about your stallion, your farm, whatever it is you're trying to, trying to promote. Um, that's kind of all I had. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything they want to add directly on advertising or if anybody has any questions about anything. I'll add one thing to something you said when you're talking about like it's so hard to figure out if your ad was impactful or where your business is coming from. If you can condition yourself and your employees, um, depending on what kind of business and how big your business is, to ask whenever you get a new customer, whenever you get an inquiry via email, call, whatever, ask how they heard about you or what motivated them to call, you can really glean a lot of information from that and start seeing which marketing avenues are helping you and which ones people just never seem to comment on. That really helps, I find. Oh yeah, definitely. That, that's that's a great point. You know, just ask where they heard about it because if you have two or three ads going, you may figure out that this ad is working real well and this one isn't. So, mm -hmm. definitely. <clears throat> so, I add to all that if you don't mind, but basically what, what we're all going to be up here talking about today is, you know, marketing and the basis of marketing is awareness. So, advertising is just one part of that that kind of top level getting people who are aware of you, who you are, what you're doing. Uh, and then that next step, which, you know, kind of what um, he has there is just building that relationship. So it's not just one touch point, it's multiple touch points, you know, over the course of, you know, however long it takes to get that person interested in what you're doing. You know, research says that at any given point, only 3% of people are ready to make that purchase. So what do you do for that other 97% of the time? And that's, you know, advertising, that's marketing, that's social, that's all the stuff we're talking about here today is just staying in front of the, the audience and, and those people until they're ready to make that purchase. You know, it may take them a year may take them two years, but as long as you're staying in front of them and being top of mind for them, they're probably going to come to you versus somebody they, you know, have to search out for, or, you know, that they don't know about. So again, you know, understanding what, what your, who your audience is, uh, where they are, where's the best way to reach those audiences for the least amount of money, uh, and also having that right message to the, to the audience, you know, knowing the demographic who you're looking for, you know, if you have uh, Indiana bread stallions that you want to breed, you know, or market to a different state. So understanding, you know, where those people are, what where they uh, hang out, basically, what they're reading, what they're paying attention to. You know, it's important to understand those venues and market accordingly in those venues. Um, the other thing that you said that makes me cringe is uh, some people don't have websites. Please, please, please have a website. You know, it doesn't. You know, they're they're getting really very inexpensive to put up. You know, you can use WordPress or something pretty easy to put up and pull up. Um, but really, your, your website should be kind of the hub of all your marketing. So whether you're doing print ads, digital, PR, you know, regardless of whatever, you know, driving that traffic back to your website so they can learn more about you, continue that relationship, maybe sign up for a newsletter that you're having. Um, you know, follow you on social or, or you know, any of those things, even make that phone call, you know, or find more, more about your facilities, your stallions, you know, your horses for sale. Um, 
and, and also on your website, you can kind of track a little bit what this advertising is doing. You know, even print ads, if you set up a specific landing page that you mentioned in those print ads, you can push those people to the website and you can track, you know, how that print ad is doing. You know, before, um, you know, if you don't have a website, it is kind of hard, you know, that unless you get calls or things like that, but, but there are other ways to do that. Uh, digital advertising is even easier because you can put a link directly to there. You can track, you know, there's Google Analytics that will let you track exactly where those links are coming from. You can tag those links. Uh, so there are ways to tell whether your advertising is working, uh, at least getting, you know, traffic to the site there too. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And even if, if you're scared of doing a website, at least do a Facebook page. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, a website, I, I would say you have to have too, but if you can't or if you're just afraid of websites, have someone help you do a Facebook page because that goes back to the whole Google search thing. If people, people are lazy and you need to make it as easy as you can for them to find out because they may have heard from someone, hey, there's a great stallion, he's by so, so and so, he's located here and they're going to search that and if they can't find it, they're going to move on to something yeah. else. So just, it's all about making it easy for people to find the information. And the good news is, you know, especially on the search and Google side, the bar is set kind of low right now. Not a lot of people have good search ability where, you know, people, because I tried to search the other day looking for, you know, stallions in Indiana. It was a hard time finding, you know, a lot of them. So if you get there, you know, especially if you get there now, you're going to have kind of a, a head start on a lot of the other ones that may come up in the next, you know, three to five years. Um, so the earlier you get there, the, be you know, the better you have on, on the rest of the, the crude. What's the best? I would say, and, and feel free to, I, I would say WordPress. <laughs> WordPress is, is very easy to use, very, it's basically free. Uh, I mean, you have to pay a little bit for hosting, but you could get, uh, including, if you're going to do it all yourself, you can get the domain name, the hosting, and everything for around 100 bucks a year, 150 at, at the most. Um, it takes a little time to set it up, but WordPress is very user friendly. Um, there's all kinds of things you can add and tweak and customize. Um, and even if you don't want to do it yourself, there's plenty of companies that have uh, fully involved templates that uh, you can you can buy a template for 50 bucks. Um, and th there's some free templates too, but you can buy a really nice template and it's kind of just fill in the blank. Um, you know, put this picture here, put this text here, and you can find someone to help you out with that too. But I would say WordPress, although there yeah. may be other options too. 90% of the ones. I tried web.com and I had so much trouble. I just I'm sorry. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> 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 it's not that hard. Yeah. 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 I was just going to add, WordPress is so common that if you find a template that you like and you go to YouTube and you put in the name of the template, you'll get 10 videos showing you how to build that website and that template. Yeah, 90% of the ones we build are built on WordPress, uh, unless they're really complicated or e-commerce based, um, if they're WordPress based. Squarespace is also a, another one that mm -hmm. I've started hearing a lot of people. What was that? Squarespace. Squarespace? Yeah. yeah. It depends on your level of, you know, how much you want to be involved with it. You know, the, basically I, I tell people is, you know, whatever's easiest for you to work and build and, and update, you know, because it's nice to have a website. It's even better to have a website that's updated regularly because uh, that's going to give you more opportunity to rank uh, and search when people are searching for things. So if you're putting up, uh, you know, daily, or not, maybe not daily, but, you know, weekly or monthly posts, news articles, press releases that are going out, um, you know, things like that on the site, that gives people more chances to, to find you that way. So being able to update your website once it's there is important too. So even if you have somebody go out and build it for you, make sure you know how to update it and, and add new content to it. Yeah, d definitely please update the websites because you'd be surprised um, some of the websites I see that haven't been updated in years. Mm -hmm. And if you have a stallion and you go to the website and it says 2015 fee, you know, is the stallion dead? Yeah. Um, is he not there anymore? And a lot of times I know that stallion's there. and. Um, if you, it, it doesn't have to be these massive news updates, but just keep it looking current. Um, you know, just do something every few weeks, even every month. Mm -hmm. Just do some so. some little updates so people know that you're there and that you're still active. Because there's just a lot of kind of.
ghost websites out there <laughs> now that you know you think the stallion's there and, and he's really not. So whatever you can do to make it look like uh, you're active and involved, um, that helps too. Any other questions just as pertaining to advertising? Okay, well if you want to do advertising and you want to build an ad, you need to have high quality photos and videos and Dennis touched a little bit on that and Chad's going to talk a little bit more about that as well. All right, Vince, you could probably just skip the first couple ones. They're just intro slides. Should be on the side there. Sorry. On the left hand side. Or just, yeah. Oh, okay. Arrow key, yeah. Next. Uh, you go back. No, uh, actually, that's fine. Whatever. I don't know if those will ever update. Anyway, all right. So basically, um, what we kind of touched on before is, you know, what is marketing? And marketing is, you know, building awareness for your your company, which is your farm, or or your products, which are your horses. So one of the best ways to do that is have. Okay, I don't know if that's ever going. to There we go. Perfect. All right, good deal. <laughs> it works. So again, you know, the best way to have that is to have really good images. So what we want to do is know who our target market is. You know, are we marketing breeders if we have stallions? Are we marketing, you know, buyers if we have offspring to sell or you know, uh, racehorses to sell? You know, what are, what are we looking at? What are their interests? What are their, you know, what are their needs? And how do we make, you know, ads content? Based on those needs to be able to, to go after those, uh, you know, marketing a horse is no real, really no different than marketing another product. It just happens to be you know a, a live product, um, or marketing a farm is no different than marketing another other company. We just need to know exactly who we're looking at, and then we build that content, you know, kind of reverse engineer it based on who who we're going after. You can go on and go. If you want. Uh, so why are we you can keep going? Why are we using videos and, and images? Well, really. Like when we're looking at the videos and images, marketers say about 37% of their marketing is based on visual. Uh, and the reason for that, especially today, is this right here. You know, more and more we're seeing people looking at their uh, phones, looking at um, things on digital, whether it's computer, tablets, mobile phones. Uh, and really we're looking at more and more of an uh, image type world. Um, People aren't reading as much. I would say, you know, that's bad for the, the print side of it. But you know, even even they're understanding that, and they're they're changing things. They're going digital. They're doing a lot more stuff online as well. But when it comes to that, people are scrolling. They're scanning. They're going through things really quickly. Um, so we have to first catch their attention. We have to make them stop, you know, scrolling and at least catch their attention and make them stop and, and pay attention. You know, it's no different than an ad in, in a magazine. You know, if somebody's flipping through the pages. If an ad catches their eyes, they're probably going to stop. And what catches their eyes is going to be that image that's in, that's in that ad. Um, you know, whether, you know, like I said, that's fine. Oh, that, that, no, you're fine. You can go on the next one. That's hard to read. Um, <laughs> so actually, there was a study that said that when people hear information or, or even read information, only about 10% of them will retain that information three days later. However, with an image, it's up to 65% of those people are going to look at, who see that image or see you know, graphics related with that image are going to retain that information. So you have a better retention rate because it's visual. People you know, understand and will keep that information in their head longer. Um, so again, you know, getting the people to notice your, your information and then they also retain it for longer uh, than just print itself. So consumers say they want to see images, they want to see photos, they want to see videos, they want to see stuff that captures their eye and you know, they want to really kind of get engaged with that. You know, there's, you can, it's hard to see it, but on that bottom left hand side is actually one that I shot 
And over the past, I think it's been three weeks, we've had over 78,000 views uh, for a, a helmet manufacturing company, uh, which is 1K Helmets. Um, very, did you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've actually done three more and they're doing just about as well. Uh, on the same, basically the same exact content, just different people, you know, sponsored riders in there as well too. But not only does that, uh, and I'll show you a little bit later how that works on, on Facebook and advertising way, but it gives me a, a good organic reach because people are interacting with it. Facebook likes videos, uh, so they're actually going to promote that more on a, or a, what we call organic, which is not paid. So people just, it's scrolling through their news feed, they'll see it. If they like the page already or if they share it, you know, they're going to be seeing it more that way. Also, on the advertising side, um, the cost to promote that type of ad, which is getting, you know, already getting some uh, engagement from people liking, sharing, viewing, is much less than, you know, just a, either a regular text ad or even just a, even an image ad. You know, we've seen the cost of, of advertising. You know, actually, I think for this one it was maybe... 0.01 cents per view, um, and, and maybe a third of those views were actually paid views. So you can understand that maybe for ten dollars we can get ten thousand, twenty thousand views pretty easy. Um, again, the whole goal of what we're what we're talking about up here is awareness. So getting in front of those people that matter, uh, and then taking that to the next step. So if you have a video, you want to make sure there's some type of element in there where they're, they're, they can take a next step. So there's a call to action where you can, you know, go here to learn more. So there's, you know, at least a, a website URL. So again, have that, that website to begin with at the end of it where they can go find more information. Um, you know, if you're doing it on Facebook, you can have content around it that's going to say, you know, a link, go here, click on this, or, or call here, or do, you know, something like that as well too. But having that, um, you know, first gaining that awareness, and second, getting them to take the next step is much easier when you have imagery, when you have videos going down that route. You know, the other thing um, you want to do is, is do something different. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, this car ad for Volkswagen which, with uh, Darth, the little kid pretending he's Darth Vader. And, uh, you know, he's kind of playing with the car and his dad plays with him back with it. You know, they're not just telling you the features of the car in this ad. You know, they create a story around it get your interest, they get you involved, they get you emotionally involved in what's going on in, in this ad. And, and, you know, they may not tell you all the features right up front, but you're interested in it. They have your attention. You, you, you know, if you're looking for a new car, you may go out and, and uh, you know, research it more, or at least it's going to be top of mind the next time you're, you're out there looking for a vehicle. So again, it, it's all about gaining the attention of your audience and who, who you're looking to go after. Go to the next one. Uh, this is a case study that I like to reference, but it's from Easy Care Boots. Uh, it's a product manufacturer, but they uh, went from producing a lot of advertising, sorry, um, to producing a lot of videos, and they use Facebook and they use YouTube. And what they did was they were able to cut their marketing budget by over two hundred thousand dollars because, again, like I said in, in the last slide, it's much easier to gain the attention you know, when you have interesting content that you're producing. You know, whether you like it or not, you guys are going to be media companies a little bit to some extent um, and producing your own content. And whether you can, you can produce it on your own, you can work with, you know, uh, groups like Ed's and, you know, jointly produce content, uh, but you really want to get out there and produce things that are going to get the attention of people who are out there. And one of the great ways to do that is through video. Um, it can be a little more expensive sometimes, but it can also be as simple as you know taking your iPhone, going out there, and, and showing the kind of behind the scenes of what's going on at farms, uh, whether or not you know you, you're you know in the breeding season, or you know see what's happening with um, the foals that you have out there. And I'll show you some examples later on. But it really doesn't have to be what what Greg's doing back there. You know, a uh, high high end camera going out there doing it every time. Uh, there are some instances when you definitely want to have that. You want to have a professional photographer, professional videographer, uh, but it doesn't have to be every time. If you want to keep going. So here's what, a little bit of what I was saying. It's not a great example, but it's just what I could find quickly. But here's the example of two images, uh, basically for the same product. Uh, these are Facebook ads, and you can kind of see the top 
top one is the top line on there. Uh, this is, I think, just for a couple of days worth. But the top line, the top image is a much nicer, much cleaner type of product image than the bottom one. And you can see the kind of the results on the, the advertising side. So like I said, you can track uh, your advertising somewhat uh, on Facebook. So this actually gives me an actual purchase rate, uh, what it costs to get somebody's attention all the way through that cycle to where they actually purchase that item. So on, on the, the top one, if you can't read it, it there was 35 purchases at $11.25. On the bottom one, there was 18 purchases at $13.25. Same spend, same copy, you know, ad copy that was with those, those images, but just a nicer image caught people's attention more and they interacted with it more. And the way Facebook works is the more interaction, the more somebody likes, shares, clicks on, on the ad, the lower the cost of your ad. Because you know, in their mind, they want to serve the best ad to their you know, to the users. So whether it's a video, whether it's a, a, an image, you always want to have that, the best one that's going to gain the most, uh, most attention. Yeah, the next one, you <coughs> so what makes a great image? So this, um, I was going to show you two, two uh, images real quick. This is from a dealer, you know, selling a Mercedes uh, Benz car. Then the next one is the same exact car but a little bit shot, just a little bit different. Same angle, you know, you can consider your three-quarter shots on your horses, but just nicer composition. Now, if you're scrolling through your Facebook feed or flipping through a magazine, which one's going to make you stop first? Probably this one. So, like, like Ed was saying, you know, you don't want that old rusty tractor in the background. You don't want, you know, um, horses standing weird or looking weird. A good image can easily sell an average horse. Um, where a bad image can ruin a really nice horse. So really think about what you're doing. Uh, if you're not a photographer uh, um, and you want those confirmation shots, you want those ad shots, anything that's going to be where you're out there spending money to promote it a lot, you definitely want to hire a professional who does this. And not just any professional. It's, we'll talk a little bit about uh, hiring those after a while. but. Uh, you want somebody that knows the horse industry, they know, you know how to shoot exactly what you're looking for, and, and they know, you know what the audience is looking for as well. Go ahead if you want. Uh, you can keep going. So again, you know, same, same concept, same horse. <laughs> Tap it. You want to go back? Again, which one's going to stop you when you're flipping through a magazine? You know, the one with the uh, nice guy leading him down? It does make him look slimmer, you know, Tap, it looks good in that picture, but, but you know, the one on the right is definitely more eye catcher, you know, it, it has some emotion to it, the lighting's really good on it, the background is, is clean, you know, it's even, um, you know, they have the depth of field where the horse is in, in focus on the front and the background's kind of blurred out on purpose, um, so it really kind of catches your eye and it really kind of, you know, makes you stop and look at it, you know, versus just the other one, which is, you know, just a photo, it could be, almost any horse at that point. So when we're talking about photos and we're talking about videos and you know, kind of which way to go and, and what to shoot and what to do, we want to know what your goals are first and then kind of work backwards. So if your goal is to you know, produce that ad in the magazine, you want to make sure that you're set up right, you, know, you have the right photographer, you have the, the horse ready to go, you know, good location shoot and, and all those. Where if you're just doing some background um, video, some behind the scenes type stuff, you're probably not going to be as, as concerned about you know, the exact lighting and, and having a professional there. Uh, but you do want to have that message that gets across to the people. If you want to go ahead and go. Um, so what should you shoot? Uh, and the answer is everything. And that's, like I said, I'm, uh, I'm not what, what you would call a professional photographer, but we do just do a lot of video. And that's actually at Windstar, shooting some babies. Um, actually, it was right after Super Saver 1. Um, so we do, you know, it can be anything, if you want to go to the next one. You know, again, you know, think about your goals. Um, and your main goal is going to be awareness, no matter kind of what you're shooting. But, you know, what, what avenue you're going to go with, with, uh, with that video, with that image that you're going to be shooting. You know, all of them should be interesting at least, um, you know, or educational or entertaining. And bonus points if you can mix two or three of those together. 
You know, if you can get at something that's interesting and educational, great. Interesting and entertaining, great. Educational and entertaining, even better. Because that's going to gain people's interest. People are going to be looking at it. They're going to be sharing it. You know, we'll talk about social media. We'll talk about how, how that affects things and, and sharing and, you know, how that can expand your reach. Um, you can go to the next one. So, again, you know, this is from my world, the reigning horse industry. But, you know, the confirmation photos, if we're going that way, we're looking to sell horses, you want to have that professional looking photo. You know, whether it's you doing it and you're, you know, good with your camera or you're hiring that professional that's going to be out there doing it. So, you want the, the photos that you're, audience is going to be looking for and that they want to they want to have in their you know repertoire what you know if somebody asks you know what's what's his hind end look like you want to have those photos ready to go and you want to have them on a professional basis you know, especially for a horse that warrants it you know for this for our industry you know a $75,000 horse that's a pretty decent horse that's a really nice horse actually um, so it's worth the spend to hire that professional to, to get those the professional uh, photos done, just like you would if you're, you know, uh, calling your vet out to do the x-rays on the horse. You know, you're not going to take those x-rays. Um, you're going to have that professional go out there and do that. You can go to the next one. So, town and country is actually my neighbors, which, uh, and, and they do actually a pretty, uh, really good job, actually, on, on what they're doing. They do a lot of behind-the-scenes type of, uh, of videos, uh, photos. And, and it pays off. You can look at their Facebook page alone, and I think they have nearly 50,000 people following them on there. Um, and you can see almost daily updates of what's kind of going on, on the farm, what's going on on the track, you know, what's going on with their horses, whether they own them now or, or they've sold them, they've gone on and done stuff, they keep up with them, they keep people interested in what they're doing. Again, it, it's about staying in front of that audience that 97% of the time until they're ready to make that purchase. Now, will all those 50,000 people make a purchase from them? Probably not, but what if even 1% did? You know, that might be more than uh, you would have gotten otherwise. So it's about playing the numbers game. How much can you put into it and how much you're going to get out of it? But really, staying in front of that, that audience is important. I think, yeah, you can see uh, even on these, um, in seven hours, that one on the left-hand side, just basically brood mares running out into the field. Simple. Shot with an iPhone or, you know, shot with mobile. Uh, had, what, 1,300 views in seven hours. Probably, you know, no promotion, just, you know, straight organic. Um, and the other one on the bottom head side had, what, 360-something, you know, people liked the page. So uh, at least that many saw it, probably a lot more. Uh, so again, having those images that people are interested in, they can see them, they can interact with them, uh, and share them, you know, especially when we talk about social, with with their, their friends. So it may not be the, the, one of the 50,000 people who are on the page, but it might be somebody who they know that they share that photo with that gets you the business that you're looking for. You can go on the next one if you want. Uh, you know, another farm, Windstar. I think we know them. Um, same, kind of same thing. Doing behind the scenes. You know, you'd be surprised how many people are interested in what goes on behind the scenes at your farms. You know, even though you, know, you think it's the everyday stuff, you kind of get bored with it and, you know, it's just, you know, everyday operations chores for you. But not everybody has, you know, the type of farms that you guys have or not everybody knows exactly what goes on, you know, behind the scenes at a different farm and, you know, they're interested in that. So again, keeping it in front of them. You back. Yeah. Oh. We're going forward. There you go. <laughs> so when to hire the professional? I don't, uh, I don't know how many of you know Barbara Livingston, but that's her taking a photo of one of my quarter horse foals. So they really get down and dirty on it. Uh, but again, you know, when to hire that professional, you can go on the next one. Uh, anytime you're going to be spending money, basically when you can't afford to have an average horse or an average image ruin the horse is when you want to hire that professional. So stallion ads, whenever you're doing anything major promotions or things like that, you want to have that you know, professional out there. Um, go to the next one if you want. Again, websites. If you can have, you know, at least your major images on, on your websites probably should be done by professionals. So this is uh, West Point Thoroughbreds. You know, that image there is, is really nice. It's going to catch your eye. It's going to draw you in. You know, I don't really like the rest of the website, at least on the left-hand side. But, you know, that image is really nice. And it's, you know, one thing if you can get somebody to stay on your, your website for longer than, you know, 10 seconds, 
you know, you can hopefully try to draw them in even further. So again, images, having that images that they catch the eye, have to draw them in, and at least start that relationship with people is important. Um, so again, you know, how to find the right photographer. Look at what they're shooting. You know, most photographers are going to have a portfolio. So it's important that they are shooting the images that you already want to have shot. So if you don't see that in that portfolio, either on the website or what they send you, probably want to move on to the next one. So, not you. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so again, you know, make sure that, that the photographer already knows kind of what shots you're looking for, you know, the three-quarter shot, the confirmation shots, and things like that, the, the style that you're looking for. So, I mean, even when we saw that, um, the Mercedes, for instance, same, comp basically, confirmation shot, three-quarter shot, you know, kind of at the shoulder or at the tire on that one, um, but way different photographs. Uh, and that's, that's the style of the photographer, you know, taking those photographs. So it does matter, you know, kind of what style they're looking at. And really, you know, it'd be great if you can, you know, kind of step out of the norm where everybody has the same same type of confirmation side, side on, things like that. If you can kind of make that a little bit different, you know, change that style a little bit. And again, going back to the Mercedes, which is why I put that in there, you know, have a little bit, you know, that st makes it stand out from the rest of the ones that are out there. That makes a big difference just from somebody, again, flipping through or scrolling through that catches their eye just for that split second that might make you or might, might get them to, you know, pay attention a little bit longer. So the DIY, you know, kind of do it yourself. You know, when when is that? That's kind of the behind the scenes we talked about. Um, you can go on the next one if you want. Um, again, everything from your your phone to the kind of the point and shoots um, to the SLRs or DSLRs um, are are great options. You know, whatever is easiest for you to use. If you can use the DSLRs, great. Uh, most of these are going to shoot photos and videos all at the same time. So Again, whatever is easiest for you to produce the best and the most amount of content, you know, go with that one. Uh, you can go to the next one real quick. Uh, again, you know, DSLRs, there's Canon or the Nikons. You know, they both have their pluses and minuses. If you want to go that route, you know, I, we started. With, I started with Canon, so we kind of have lenses for those, so it's hard to switch once you're kind of down that road. But it it doesn't matter as much as, as learning how to use it, uh, learning how to, you know learning what lenses, what settings are all the best for those. And I'm not going to go over those too much right now because that that's another you know, day seminar. But um, you know, there's plenty of uh, educational things out there uh, that will kind of show you how to shoot horses, what, what f-stops to use, what lenses to use. You, know, you want to use a, a telephoto lens uh, if you can, you know, high, high shutter speed, to, especially if there's a horse in action. Um, so kind of those things you want to pay attention to, but again, um, you know, my recommendation would be one of these if you want to spend the time to learn to use it. You know, they can get a little, little expensive, you know, maybe start at, I think a basic one would be, you know, five to eight hundred hours. But if you figure if you're selling, you know, a thousand dollars of horses, it, it's, it can be worth the investment or worth the time to learn how to use it or have somebody on your team learn how to use it and go that route. I uh, just want to, you know, thank everybody. Um, and if you guys have any questions for me or anybody on the, on the panel, now would be a good time. Okay, guys, we're going to start continue on with the seminar. Um, the next part we're going to talk about is social media. And I want to thank Vance for stepping up. I know if you've been on the Facebook page and Facebook group, where I was talking about Ed DeRosa joining us, um, but he was not able to attend. so. We want to thank Vance for stepping in and um, helping us out with this. This is his, he said this is his first seminar, so we'll be nice to him. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, social media is one of the largest growing avenues of advertising anywhere. So it's really important to kind of learn a little bit about the basics. And I know all four of these guys have a lot of experience in it. So feel free to ask questions after Vance's. Um, presentation and we'll do a little bit more discussion about it. Thanks, Vance. Well, thank you, Megan. Uh, I'm going to kind of take an, um, the approach to this uh, talking a little bit about my companies that I work for, Twinspires.com and Brisnet.com. Uh, as Megan mentioned earlier, 
I've worked for the, the companies for like nine years now, but it's only really been in the last uh, five years or so that we've really uh, hit hard uh, uh, producing social media content and, and driving uh, customers uh, to our websites. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you probably are familiar with both of them. Twinspires.com is a advanced deposit wagering company, online wagering, and uh, Brisnet.com uh, traditionally uh, is uh, sold pedigree products and uh, handicapping products to uh, horse players around the country. Uh, so uh, I think the first question most people ask when they want to think about social media is uh, which social media network should I join and the real answer is all of them because uh, every single one of them uh, will include someone in your audience and there's something that you have uh, to offer to them. Uh, just for an example, uh, Twinspires.com Twitter uh, followers number about 15,900 and we have about 40,000 uh, followers on Facebook. Uh, brisnet.com we also have Twitter uh, and Facebook accounts with them uh, not not as not as followed as much but they're pretty much intertwined uh, brisnet has 12,500 followers on Twitter and 4,000 followers on Facebook and uh, the main goal obviously with social media is having a presence and uh, being part of the conversation uh, uh, social media obviously has changed the way we pres we uh, let people know about advertising and about news and uh, that's basically kind of what we are as a more uh, what I do as a as an editorial writer kind of a presenting news and opinion and sending it out to uh, uh, followers and making sure they see our products and uh, obviously one of the main goals for Twinspires.com is generating uh, new customers who will go ahead and bet horses through our uh, account wagering platform and uh, main goal for Brisnet obviously is selling our handicapping products, our pedigree products and presenting them in a uh, uh, informational and entertaining fashion. And uh, one of the luxuries that we have uh, as far as uh, our social media team, we've got a lot of uh, uh, people who do social media in our companies both in Louisville in our main headquarters and in our Lexington office where I'm at. Uh, we have an editorial staff of four in Lexington and uh, because of the manpower that we have we're able to touch a lot of base cover all of our bases whether it's uh, Twitter Facebook Instagram uh, any social media outlet you can name uh, uh, we each have our kind of niche some of us like to uh, or are more are more proficient using Facebook a lot of us are more active on Twitter but uh, as I said before the manpower that we have uh, we're able to cover a lot of bases. Now, I know in smaller organizations, probably like uh, most of you uh, belong to, uh, you know, the manpower isn't going to be there. It could be one or two people or just yourself. But the, the main focus is, or the main thing to take away from this is that even if you do uh, start participating in social media, there's no rule that says you have to be on there, you know, t active on there 24 hours a day. Even if you, uh, you know, hop in once a week, once in a while, or once or twice a week, uh, you know, that in itself just, uh, it, it keeps you in the game, it keeps you in the conversation, you have that presence, it doesn't have to be a daily uh, grind for you to go on there and to uh, get the word out about your product, about your horse, uh, j just just be, you know, semi-active once or twice a week, and uh, and, and uh, as far as who is in charge of it, I mean, social media is pretty uh, easy to grasp once you just get started. Uh, but uh, it's also not a bad way to um, get some of your employees involved. Let's say you own a farm um, and you have, you know, a young person working on the farm who's active on social media already. Um, you know, if you trust them to do their job on the farm, uh, you know, working with the horses themselves, uh, there certainly can be possibly trustworthy uh, with your brand, what you want to get out on social media. So, uh, you know, delegating some social media duties to those kind of employees uh, could be pretty beneficial. Um, and uh, as I mentioned on the third point down here below, it's also worth noting that each social networking site has something to offer for you. So I'll quickly go through uh, 
some of the different social media uh, platforms and uh, mention their uh, positive attributes. Uh, Facebook, uh, the size of, uh, of the audience, uh, I think we've all kind of seen the uh, statistics that near, you know over a billion people worldwide, maybe two billion, I'm not sure, I lost track of the uh, number of people in, on, on earth that are uh, connected to Facebook in some fashion and obviously not all are going to be interested in horses or horse racing but uh, I mean the market there is just and the size of the audience is just spectacular. Uh, the opt-in features for Facebook, uh, you know, this was kind of uh, mentioned before uh, when Dennis brought this up, even if you don't have a web page, you know, at least try and have a Facebook page. Uh, they're easy to create. Uh, they're more act more interactive. You have the, you have uh, uh, control, and there's multiple ways to present yourself on Facebook. It has a mix, plenty of mixed media, where whether it's just putting out still photography, uh, videos, uh, which have been alluded to before, are extremely popular. Uh, even audio uh, is is can be a, a benefit and. Uh, one of the things that we've done at Twin Spires in the last several years, a, a, col a couple of colleagues and I, Ed DeRosa and, and myself, have put out uh, you know, videos twice a week and we'll post them to Facebook and uh, link them on Twitter. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll, one of them is called Turf Talk. You know, we'll kind of discuss the, you know, the major horse races, the major issues going on in the industry today, kind of give a five minute uh, opinion piece on that. And, Another uh, uh, video production we typically do is called On Point, and that's where we have uh, myself and uh, another colleague uh, who concentrate on handicapping, and uh, we'll kind of preview the upcoming major stakes races uh, for the weekend. And uh, so that's just uh, one way we've uh, uh, used Facebook. Uh, moving on to Twitter, uh, the positive attribute for Twitter is it's a real-time conversation. Uh, in, they say Twitter has pretty much changed the news business. Everything is found out instantaneously, and that, that that's very true. Uh, Twitter kind of brings out the authenticity in the people, and uh, you really can't. Uh, your true colors are typically shown on Twitter. I mean, uh, uh, for better or for worse, sometimes. But uh, that that's one of the attributes, and. Uh, that middle point I have up there is called able to put out fires and uh, you know obviously when you're a, a personality on Twitter or your presence on Twitter you're, you're going to be a, a potential target for criticism justified or not and uh, but uh, you know knowing the and, and addressing uh, critiques or criticism from others uh, you're able to uh, keep things from potentially snowballing on Twitter it's a it's a forum for a quick reaction uh, and you can quickly diffuse any problems on Twitter. So that's uh, one of the major pluses. Uh, Instagram and Sta Snapchat, uh, you're kind of a low-key social media, you know, picture-oriented. Uh, you're able to showcase yourself as a fun brand. Uh, not as much uh, uh, back for feedback from the audience, and uh, you can tightly control your message on, the, on that particular social media. Uh, my colleague Ed DeRosa is mostly constant is the one uh, in our company that's mostly uh, uh, on Instagram and Snapchat. Uh, LinkedIn, I think we're, a lot of us are aware of that and uh, originally conceived as a way for uh, potential employees and employers for finding each other. It's, uh, it's kind of developed into a life of its own and it's a lot more than that these days. Um, Lots of push to its users, and, uh, and and it serves all sorts of different uh, uh, ways. And it's ways to get connected, and uh, being out on LinkedIn and get and helps uh, build your brand trust and promoting it and promoting yourself as an authority uh, in whatever facet of the industry you might possibly in. And it's also a, a good way to get feedback uh, from uh, uh, potential customers and clients. Uh, YouTube, I think we're all, a lot of us are familiar with that, uh, showcasing creativity with videos and, uh, and definitely uh, your best chance to uh, uh, get organic uh, viral message or everything to go viral uh, out there on Twitter. Uh, and you'll notice on under Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube we have what uh, SEO, 
which is called, which is refers to the search engine uh, optimization, and uh, this was brought up by uh, Chad a little bit earlier. Uh, you, you know, using Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, if you use search engines to try and find something, uh, you're automatically going to be sent to mo one of these sites, most likely, whether you're whatever you're searching for. Uh, using those three social uh, media outlets. Uh, people are more likely to find your stuff and find you, uh, especially on LinkedIn. I think it's usually one of the uh, top returning social media sites. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about social media, it's about me, it's not you, you, Udia. Uh, pardon me there. Uh, it's okay to make your social media pres uh, presence all about you. It's about your brand. It's a way to get your message out. Uh, no one's going to brag or tell your story without you wanting to do it yourself. Uh, it's, it, it, the ball's kind of in your court, and that's why I think it's uh, extremely important to uh, make that social media uh, presence a part of your uh, uh, business plan. Uh, it gets you part of the community and makes, uh, makes you follow what's going on in, in the industry. And uh, the third point I have down there, uh, it's not always a uh, platform to brag about things. It's also a way to celebrate other people's triumphs, offer encouragement, and uh, occasionally post uh, fun things on there as well, as we've, know, as we've alluded to. Uh, as Chad mentioned earlier, uh, one of the core audiences of social media are people that love horses. Uh, I mean, pictures. Uh, get retweeted and uh, get likes on Facebook, and it's just incredible. And we and we at Twin Spires and Brisnet, uh, as I, as I mentioned on the slide here, uh, uh, a lot of our most popular uh, posts and uh, retweets and stuff come from uh, you know individual horse pictures, and they can be uh, horses you know working out. Let's let's say Songbird put in a workout at Santa Anita put out a picture of that, it's going to be one of the most popular things that we do, do all day long. Uh, way more popular than the uh, generic news story about how quickly she ran in, uh, uh, in, in her workout. So uh, de definitely uh, don't be, uh, don't be uh, hesitant at all about sharing pictures, videos, whether that's from the barns, the paddock, the, the sheds. Uh, people just kind of devour that, and it's a great way to uh, increase exposure to the game. Chad brought up a lot of this earlier. And uh, I mentioned uh, contests and giveaways. That's another very popular uh, thing that we do at Twin Spires, and we take kind of no shame in, you know, putting, providing contests and giveaways just to get our brand exposure out in that particular uh, fashion. Uh, pardon? I say when you do the contest, you also get what? Uh, yeah. Emails, absolutely. We get we get the pushes, and uh, you know, and as easy as uh, it is to uh, you know generate generate interest from hor horses and people who love horses and maybe aren't uh, particularly uh, uh, aware about the wagering side or the handicapping side. It's also a another thing that we often do is uh, we also you know, concentrate our, on our core audience with our social media uh, through Facebook and Twitter. You know, as a, I've been doing a lot of handicapping and uh, news writing for the last 18 years, and uh, obviously, a lot of our core audience are betters, heavy betters, uh, as, as far as Twin Spires, and uh, we we also want to target that audience as well. Good for the bottom line, obviously, and uh, the. They love uh, learning our opinions, knowing what our opinions are, whether it's on racing issues, whether it's who we like uh, uh, on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, it, it's just uh, it's a way to balance out what we push, what we put out on social media. We we want to target that core audience, but we uh, and you know sometimes uh, in the industry, I think some people think that we maybe maybe dumb down. Uh, how we present the sport too much, but I, uh, and that might be the case, and uh, sometimes, but we all, we'd like to take that uh, kind of balance and uh, 
just kind of speaking from personal experience, you know, I've, I started uh, following racing uh, about 30 years ago. I was kind of grade school age, you know, like third, fourth grade, basically, and uh, and uh, you know, it, that times were a lot different back then. And we obviously didn't have social media, and but uh, I don't I don't recall. Uh, you know, learning about the sport or getting really interested in it, you know, having it presented to me in a kind of a simple fashion, uh, I might be kind of unusual in that respect. You know, I, I sought out information through, uh, you know, books, newspapers, and that sort of thing. So there is, uh, there's definitely a market for people that want to be the, the sport and the industry to present it in a, uh, uh, in a uh, more sophisticated way and. Uh, and like, and so uh, the advice that I provide to you, as far as you know, presenting your business or organization on social media, uh, is uh, present yourself as an expert. You know, uh, people are willing to, uh, you know, learn from that, and they want to know uh, the ins and outs and the specifics of the industry. And uh, like I said, we discuss handicapping and we discuss breeding uh, through our social media channels. So. Uh, if anybody else has anything else to add, and or from the floor, uh, you're welcome to. I would, one thing I try to keep in mind and tell my clients when they're doing their social media, everything you said was so important and so spot on, but it's also good to be constantly aware of um, what people are posting on your page, especially you know with Facebook people post on your page and everything's public so if they post something negative or if they misunderstood or are misinformed you need to be addressing that and managing your message um, and there's a lot of ways you know if someone posts something negative um, about horse racing or about something you posted it gives you a great opportunity to spin it in a positive direction and say you bring up a really good point I'm glad you said that it's actually XYZ instead of ABC and so if you do it in a way that kind of presents you and positions you like he's saying as a leader and an expert, it becomes an educational opportunity. Do you, any of you, do you ever advise any of your clients to delete any negatives? Or is it better to use it as that educational opportunity to spin it for positive? I think that depends on how negative the negative is <laughs> and how there's some people who are just out for blood, you know, and I mean, he does a great example example of that. They'll get people just prod and prod and prod, and they will not let facts get in the way of what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and so I always feel like if you try and they're still just taking very negative slants, even though you're trying to be congenial and positive with them, that's when I take it offline. And I message them privately before you delete them from your public page, uh -huh. make the link to be able to message them privately, then delete it, message them and say, hey, I didn't want to offend anyone outside of this subject, so I deleted your post, but I wanted to talk to you about it and understand where you're coming from and just always take that mm -hmm. nurturing educational Every response even though you just want to throw it out. Yeah, the good thing about social is, you know, when you have situations like that, if you've built a community, you know, people are following you. A lot of times your community will jump in too. Yeah. So the people that are following you, people are, you know, engaged on a regular basis, they're gonna jump in and, you know, either defend or correct or, or you know, respond to it as well, even sometimes before you get there. So it's not you know, the nice thing about that is not just you saying, you know, you're you're done. You know, there's all these other people in there too. So that's why you know the great thing about social media is you get that chance to build that community where, you know, just advertise in general, you don't have that back and forth a lot. You, know, you get to, to ask questions. You get to say, you know, you know, ask a question on a certain day, and that, that's some of the best posts we see out there. It's best engagement is when we ask a question. You know, what are you interested in? You know, what do you think about this? You know, who do you think is going to win the, you know, the next race? Blah, blah, blah. But it gets people involved. People want to hear themselves talk, you know? Whether it's good or bad, you know, people want, want to be heard. Uh, a lot of times, some of those people that are, that are saying those negative things are just you know, they want to vent somewhere. Uh, you know, that's what's on their mind. That you know, and social media is an easy way just to kind of you know spew spew it out there, whether they're right or wrong. You know, sometimes they just want to be heard. You know, even when I was you know working at the, as an editor um, at the horse, you know, people would call up and, and we'd say you know 
send them up to us instead of letting customer service. But they wanted to, you know, gripe about an article we put out or, or do whatever. But a lot of times they just wanted to be, you know, wanted, wanted to have their side heard. And they wanted to know that somebody was out there listening to them. You know, and we talk about it and, and we could, you know, a lot of times we turn that specific person into, you know, more than just a customer, but, you know, almost into a brand evangelist because they <coughs> had their voice heard. You know, we spent the time and we listened to them. You know, we, we, you know, got to hear their side of the story, you know, had that conversation with them. And we built a relationship with them just because of that. Uh, and that's, that's the greatest thing about social media is you get to build those relationships. You know, like I talked about before, you know, the top of the sales funnel, we'll say, is awareness. Just getting people aware of you. The next part is building that relationship. Nobody's going to buy uh, a horse from somebody they don't know. You know, nobody's going to you know ship their mare uh, to a stallion that they don't know. That person, in some way, shape, or form, they don't have to have a handshake with them, but they have to know kind of who they are, what their values are, what you know, what their facilities like. And they, you know, they want to know what type of person it is. You know, they say, what is it? In good times, we do business with people we know, like, and trust. In bad times, we only do business with people we know, like, and trust. And that's a big point of, of social media, is building that trust, building those relationships with our potential customers out there uh, and going on that route. So, kind of long answer to short question. So. Okay, that's good. One other question. Is there a optimal number of posts to make a day or recommendation on that? As many as you need and as few as <laughs> depends on your business and your brand too. It does. You know? yeah. Depends on your audience. Uh, depends on what you're looking for. You know, the great thing about social media, all of these that, that he spoke about, they all have analytics. So you know exactly how you're performing. So the biggest thing I suggest say to the people is test. So maybe one week do one post a day. Uh, the next week do two posts a day. Uh, and then see, you know, they also tell have you a analytics on like Facebook, especially is is when people are on. So you don't want to be posting at 3 a.m. in the morning unless that's when your audience is there looking at it. Uh, you know, in this industry, it, it may be just because you know we're up early. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, again, you know, test different times a day, test different amounts per day, uh, test different platforms. You know, not not every platform is going to, you know be as uh, interactive as, as another one. So, you know, test. That's the biggest thing. You can also schedule your posts, mm -hmm. yeah. which I find super helpful because oh. social media can be like that rabbit hole that you can get sucked into. But if you can block out like two hours a week and you can schedule all your posts for a week, and then all you have to do is check in and monitor who's on your page, who's commented, interact with their comments, and it saves a ton of time. And I was going to point that out. I know a lot of people, um, social media I'm really passionate about. In my last job I was a social media strategist. And I know a lot of things people are scared about with it is that they believe it's time consuming. And it can be. Like Jen said, you can catch yourself going down the rabbit hole. I know I do every morning. Um, but, you know, especially for those that are just starting to get into it, you can schedule your posts on Facebook. So if you want to take some time on Monday and say, oh, I might, I think I want to post, you know, this picture of our stallion out in the field, stuff like that, you can go ahead and schedule all that stuff. It's pretty easy, you know, and there's, a, you can also, if you, you know, can't figure it out, there's Google or you can even contact me and I can help you guys out with that, that kind of stuff. You can do that. There's different social media, um, management systems. There's like Hootsuite, different programs like that you can use. Um, if you want to go the free route, there's pro there's like TweetDeck and for Twitter um, and just different programs like that. And one of the cool things about like with Instagram and Facebook and Twitter is you can connect your accounts into one. So if you post an Instagram post, you can have it go on to Twitter and on Facebook at the same time. Boom, you just hit three social media channels at once. Um, one example that I like I like to kind of share is back when I was at Blood Force Publications, um, I can't remember who it is, but it was during the derby, during the workouts, one of our editor, one of the editors at the Blood Horse was at, was at Churchill Downs and had posted a video of one of the top contenders, I think it was Hanson, 
um, rolling on the backside. And he just did it. He was on the backside and he was like, oh, hey, you know, and just took his phone out and took the video, posted it on their Facebook. It was one of the biggest videos that Blood Horse had ever done and still is. And all it was was a horse rolling in the dirt because, oh my gosh, he's handsome, he's so pretty, and he, now he's rolling in the dirt and he's being a horse. <laughs> there are going to be horses. So when we, when our experts are saying, you know, you can even just post the mundane things, just something like that. I know, um, I, you know, shout out to Swifty Farms. I reposted a picture of their foals the other day. They posted on their Facebook page because it just was one of those things that's like, oh, it's such a pretty day and they're just laying there. And so the Thoroughbred, you know, our the Thoroughbred Facebook page reposted it and shared it because it was just something, you know, nice and simple. And it was just something that you can just do from your phone and you can post it. And I know it's, I know social media is kind of one of those things that, especially for older generations, it's a little scary. Um, you know, whereas like the younger generations, I know my daughter's already taking selfies and she's two. <laughs> um, I look on my phone all the time and I'm like, oh, there's Aubrey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, they're figuring it out a lot easier. So, you know, don't be afraid to ask your children. Don't be afraid to ask your employees or you know, to kind of help you out, do a little research on it if you have questions. And, you know, we're here to help you as well as the commission. I'm, you know, able to help you get things figured out because, like I said, that's one of the things that we want to do is we want to help you guys help yourselves. So, um, but yeah, social media is one of those things that you can really get a good bang for your buck. And I was hoping somebody would talk a little bit about social media advertising a little bit. and paid advertising and boosted posts. If anybody on the panel wants to touch base on that a little bit. Are you looking at me? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> well, only because Wendy's head is blocking that <laughs> and that is so I just had that, you know, if anybody can touch base and explain a little bit about paid advertising on Facebook or boosted posts. Yeah, I mean I, I touched on it a little bit earlier, but you know one of the oh, oh actually I'll take a step back. And uh, you know the reason Social media is so important, again, it's because of this. You know, every, everybody has one of these pretty much in their hands now or with them all day long. You know, people have withdrawals if they get too far away from it. You know, if it's not at arm's reach, people start to, you know, hyperventilate sometimes. But, you know, the reason we're seeing, you know, such a huge uptick in it is because it's so accessible on our phones and it's with us all the time. You know, we see it from our analytics on, on you know, across Facebook and across all the, all the social medias that we're, we're actually seeing 70%, 60-70% usage, mobile usage, versus desktop. Uh, we're seeing kind of the same trends tick up uh, on our websites as well. So last year we probably saw a 60-40, you know, web or, a mo or desktop to mo mobile. And this year we're seeing 50-50 or even, you know, swinging towards the mobile side of it as well. So if you're not paying attention to mobile, and not paying attention to social, you're going to be at a disadvantage in the next several years. Um, you know, one of the great things about social as well too is the targeting aspect of it. Facebook knows everything about you, sometimes even more than you do. Um, they know how to target you. They know exactly, you know, based on what you're looking at, what you're doing, uh, who you're interacting with, who your friends are. You know, they can almost predict when you're getting ready to have kids. You know, Target actually does that in their, in their targeting. Um, but it, it makes advertising very easy because we can target exactly who our potential customers might be. Uh, and what that does is, is it takes out um, the ones we don't want to, you know, or don't need to target to, and it makes advertising much less expensive uh, because we can, you know, go to the ones we exactly want. Uh, we can actually track who who is interacting with them. We can retarget to those. So. Somebody comes to our website, somebody signs up for email, somebody you know enters a contest, uh, like Vince was saying, we can go back and remarket to them as well. So we can send ads just to those people or to a lookalike audience, which would be people who are like those people. Um, so again, if we have email addresses, if we have some type of action, even if it's just coming to our website or, or uh, now we can target people who watch videos on our, on our Facebook pages, um, it gives us that, that whole range of, of advertising 
uh, and marketing that we didn't have access to before. Uh, and it can be very inexpensive. Um, like I said, that on, on the video, I think we promoted it for um, maybe, I don't know, $30, $40, more than that. Um, but again, it was, it was less than one cent per view. Uh, where else can you find, where else can you, you know, reach that many people for that low amount of money? Um, you know, there, there is a little bit of a learning curve when you get started with it. It can look intimidating, especially on Facebook ads. Uh, you, know, the, you know, the Facebook ad manager or um, can be a little daunting to look at. But you know, once you get started, once you get rolling uh, and figure it out, it's it's not that hard. Uh, it gives you great analytics. You can test, and just like I showed you on, on the photos, you can test one photo against the other, test different copy against the other, uh, and you can see almost instantly which one's performing better, and double down on, the, on that, um, and kind of keep testing variations of that as well too. Um, most of what we do for our clients is going to be Facebook, Instagram, um, and maybe Pinterest based, just depends. You know, we do a lot of products, so, you know, Pinterest, or, or in, yeah, Pinterest uh, is, a, is kind of big for us on that as well, too. But we see probably, again, at least half our traffic to our websites coming from social. Um, versus search or versus somebody just typing it in. Um, so it is important to pay attention to whether you're doing advertising or, or just doing kind of organic, non-paid stuff. Uh, but again, the cost to advertise on social is, is very inexpensive um, to go down the route. No, okay. okay. <laughs> and an important aspect to note is um, if you're not very familiar with Facebook and you want to create a page you're, you need to make sure that you're creating a business page, that you are doing a page and you're not doing like a personal profile. Um, there's different ways that you can do that, but if you do just like your personal profile, like if I just did online, you're limited on how many friends you can have and people will request to be your friend and to follow you. Whereas if you have your business page, then any number of people can follow. You don't even have to approve them on your page. So that's one less step you have to worry about doing. And then you can connect it to, if you want to do paid advertising, you can connect that to business manager on Facebook and you can then do your ads and ad manager. So that's an important note, um, an important note to say. But um, there's one more thing. Oh, and make sure when you are on Facebook and you are doing some things, if you can, you try to tag people that you people that are maybe in your photos, tag stallions. I know when we are posting th posting images on our on the commission's Facebook pages, especially if we're touting, you know, winners of um, Indiana Sire Stakes for standard breads or Indiana breads, you know, we will try if the stallion is on Facebook or the farm that owns the stallion or the breeders are on Facebook and they have a page, I'll tag them. What that does is that then also goes on their page and creates more traffic. And then people be like, if people are on the Indiana Redevelopment's pages and they see, oh, this horse, you know, Notional is, you know, there's a link to Notional's page and I can click on his page and, oh, there he is, and I can learn more information about Notional. There's a lot of stallions that have, um, that have their own pages on Facebook and farms that have their own pages on Facebook and that's a really nice thing to do and you know if you have a personal you know if you have your own personal profile you can tag that kind of, tag that kind of stuff as well and create more um, more traffic to the Facebook pages and hopefully to your website so it's basically social media is word of mouth and we know word of mouth is the cheapest most um, impressive amount form of advertising and that's exactly what social media is and I know that here at the track, you know, Tammy not with the, the marketing, she puts out press releases yeah. and stories almost about every winner of each race. So if you've got some prodigy out there winning races, share that from the track. Mm -hmm. You know, share that on your page. It just shows more attention um, back to your horses and your stallion. Any questions or anything else to add about social media? 
Who here has a social media page for their stallion or their farm? Okay. Who here has Facebook, period? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who here after today is thinking about at making their own pages for their stallions or farm? <laughs> okay, come on, at least one person has. <laughs> okay. Um, next, for our last session of the morning, um, Jen Voice is going to talk a little bit about public relations and just everything else that runs the gamut of marketing and advertising. All right. Let me get this going. All right. Well, thanks. And thanks for having us all here, Megan. This has been a ton of good information here and really trying to tick all the boxes of how you can create your brand and your voice and, and get it out to your target audiences. Um, so I own a communications agency in Lexington, and we do... Uh, comprehensive communications. So it's advertising, it's um, all different forms of marketing, printed pieces, social media, websites, everything. But I really feel like where our clients get the most bang for our buck, or their buck, is um, public relations. And I think a lot of them would say the same thing. Um, I kind of think of public relations as, you know, speaking to your different publics. So you're trying, obviously, to speak to your customer base, but you're also speaking to your potential customer base. You're speaking to the media in some instances. You're speaking to just the general non-horse savvy audience, or maybe the audience that likes horses and is an aspirational horse owner but hasn't made that jump yet, and you might have a hand in converting them into a horse owner. Um, so when I, before I had my marketing agency. I was the marketing director at Three Chimneys Farm in Lexington for about six to seven years. Um, when I started there, I promise the story relates to everything we're going to talk about. Um, when I started there, Robert Clay, who was the owner at the time, um, on one of my first days sat me down and he said, I just want to talk to you about what your role is here, which I was very interested in what that was going to be as well. <laughs> and um, he said, obviously, first and foremost, we want you to be marketing the farm and marketing the stallions and promoting them and, and whatnot, but a very close secondary that's important to always keep in mind and that I am knowingly paying you for is to promote the industry. It was very important to him that a function of my job was not just to focus on the farm, but to look past that and lift the industry up in the eyes of all of the various stakeholders, from the industry insiders to the aspirational owners to the haters who are totally against horse racing, everyone you're trying to reach or that you might find yourself in front of. Um, and I really, it was a very refreshing perspective because it was very selfless um, in a lot of ways, but it allowed us to leverage our brand in a lot of ways, and I really think it's a good thing the more I, I saw the benefits of it while I was there for those six or seven years, the more I really feel like that should be a function of anyone's marketing strategy and especially their public relations plan. Um, a lot of times, you know, Three Chimneys was always very media friendly and very um, open to when no one else wanted to talk about the subject, we were happy to answer the tough questions and, and put ourselves out there again representing the industry, not necessarily trying to sell more seasons at the time to like Dinah former Arahi. Um, they really positioned us as a leader in the industry, but we weren't spending nearly as much as a lot of the other farms we were competing against. Um, and a lot of that was due simply to public relations. So I think the most important aspect of public relations and the one that people are probably thinking of the most when they think about public relations is putting out press releases or making announcements. And so for stallion farms, for example, I, I'm gathering that a lot of the crowd here is, you know, stallion farm oriented or has some kind of interest in that arena of the industry. That could be putting out a press release to announce a new stallion standing at your farm, announce the first foals by a stallion, something like that. And that definitely is very important to be able to put out a proper press release. The first thing you need to do in order to put out a proper press release is have 
a dependable media list. Um, I always try to structure my media list as a primary and a secondary tier of media. So you, just, you can do something as simple as an Excel spreadsheet on your computer. Think about all the publications that you would want to be disseminating your information to. So it would be Blood Horse, Thurber Daily News, Daily Racing Forum, Pollock Report, American Race Horse, um, Horse Racing Nation. There's a ton of them out there. Think about what your primary target audience is if you're all of a sudden in two days you have to announce something big from your farm. You can go to each one of their websites and you just have to search around a little bit to see where they ask for news to be sent. Like at Blood Horse, for example, there's an email address that's just editorial at bloodhorse.com. That gets sent to the entire editorial staff. Other places, it might be ray at pollockreport.com or it, it might be Dennis's email address. It just depends on the publication, but just do a little bit of legwork and, and put that list together. And then that secondary media list is the stuff that you wouldn't necessarily send all of your news to, but if it's something newsworthy enough or something unique enough, you might want to send it to that entire secondary list or cherry pick a few off of there. So, I don't know, for example, um, let's say you have a white foal born at your farm, and that is something that's going to appeal not only to the thoroughbred news, but that'll appeal to your local newspaper, that'll appeal to, it could be something your Chamber of Commerce would be interested in. If they put stuff out, it could be something that your local news stations would be interested in. So that secondary media list is just anyone and everyone you could think of that you might ever want to reach if you have the opportunity to. All of your local television stations, your local newspapers. Um, I always like to include some non-racing equestrian websites like maybe Horse Channel, um, or Horse Network, you can put some magazines on there like Practical Horseman or Chronicle of the Horse, but you never know when the opportunity will present, but every once in a while you'll have a piece of news that if you want to get it out there, it's, it's relevant to more than just your, your primary media list. So I think it's good to have those two. So let's say you have a stallion with its first foals being born and you want to put out a press release. So the easiest way to do it is just, like Dennis was saying, make sure you have a good logo and brand the press release with your logo. And then also make sure you put the date on there, put the contact person on there that you want any inquiries or questions to come to. Um, so I always put my phone number, my um, email address, and also if I'm sending it out on behalf of a client, I put the contact person at the farm's phone number and email address. You never know if the press is going to be more comfortable contacting me because they know me personally or the farm because they need to get the information quicker and they're just going to reach straight out to them. The first um, paragraph of the press release, I there's two schools of thought on press releases. I tend to write them, if I'm writing a press release on behalf of a client, like for first foals for a farm or something like that, I write it very factually oriented. I don't put a lot of flowery language. I don't add opinions in saying that these are the most impressive foals that ever were. If you want to quote someone saying that, awesome. You can even quote yourself saying that as long as it's attributed to someone because the press release, in my opinion, should be unbiased. So you put your who, what, where, when, and why in that first paragraph. We had uh, a Bay Philly out of uh, Posing queen born at Swifty Farm by Notional on this day, um, something like that. You know, very factually oriented. And then you go on to include information about the stallion. Then you'd include information about the dam. And then you'd include information about the farm. And you could pepper into that, I'd say probably one paragraph on the dam, two paragraphs on the stallion. If he's a really cool stallion, you could add a third paragraph. <laughs> Um, and then one paragraph about the farm. Um, and then you can pepper quotes in between. So if, you, if the horse is owned by a client, maybe get a quote from the client if that would be something that would endear them to you and they have something worth saying to say. Um, if they're not a horse person, then maybe the farm manager says something about, you know, this is a well-built, sturdy, full, good leg, good hip, whatever. Um, 
And then you can also add in, if you have some quotes that you found online about the stallion, maybe the stallion was trained by Todd Pletcher and after, after he retired, maybe Todd Pletcher was quoted as saying, this horse has no reason not to make it as a stallion. He's well built and his foal should be the same. Then you can include that in there as well and that just gives you more content to give to the media. And in return, that does the legwork for them. Um, the last thing you want to put on a press release is what's called your boilerplate. And that's basically just your non-changing, unless you update it slightly, um, description of what your entity is, what the entity that's sending the press release out is. So for Three Chimneys Farm, it was uh, owned by Robert Clay. Three Chimneys Farm was founded in 1981. It started with 100 acres and today stands 12 stallions, including some of our best stallions. Um, encompasses 1,200 acres and consigns, boards, buys and sells, something like that. You know, just kind of like the stamp of your farm, how you want to represent yourself. And basically, my view of doing all of this is that you're trying to make it as easy as possible for the media to cover you. The less, it sounds awful, and I will say I also write for a couple publications, so I'm, I'm kicking myself as well when I say this. The less work the media has to do, the better, because you can't depend on them. If they're having a super busy day, you don't know that if you're sending out a press release. And if they're having a super busy day, they might just take what you sent them and post it. So you want there to be as much information about your stallion and your farm and yourself as possible on there. Um, another thing that is sometimes a nice option to do if you have the reason to is a press packet instead of a press release. Let's say, again, you have a first stallion who has its first foals, but he's slow to book up. Or you have a horse that's retiring to your farm. Um, a nice thing that you could do is send a press packet to all of the media. You can do that uh, in the mail or digitally. I, I tend to be old school and I like to do it in the mail because I feel like everyone these days is getting so many emails, they're inundated and things can get lost or if they're, again, having a busy day, they might not read through all of their emails or they might see like more than five words and they just can't even deal. And so <coughs> if you send out a press packet, that just basically presents everything they'd ever need to know about the topic you're hoping that they'll cover. So. Um, when I worked at Three Chimneys and we had Big Brown retire to the farm, we sent press, <laughs> that's a whole nother story. There's we sent press packets out for a couple of reasons. One was to make sure the media knew everything we wanted them to know about him because he had a, a kind of obscure female, fan, female family and he was by boundary, which is not exactly Stormcat. So they knew everything he'd done on the track, but the media wasn't as familiar with his pedigree and all of the insights that made him appealing as a stallion um, and all the crosses there would be. And you can't depend on the media to know about that stuff because they do not know your business as intimately as you know your business. So it's your job to help them understand it in an easily digestible way so they can present it as their own information. So. When he retired from the track, we sent out press packets that included um, a ton of, we had a ton of photos taken of him and selected the best ones and sent out a disc of photos. So they, they were welcome to use any of those photos in any press that they did on him at any time. At that time, years from then, whatever. But we had control over what photos they had, so we had cherry picked the best photos and sent those to him. We sent out everything about, you know, his stallion page was in there, his pedigree was in there. We had a pedigree expert do a write-up on all of the insights that he saw on the horse. Um, so that way it wasn't even us saying it, it was a third-party expert. Um, what else did we have in there? We had a brochure, his, his own stallion brochure, as well as our farm stallion brochure. So if anyone wanted to do more of a feature story, they also had information about the farm. We packed it with Every, oh, and we looked up a list of quotes, and there was a page in there with quotes of anything anyone had ever said. Handicappers at Brisnet had things to say about him through his racing career. His trainer had things to say, unfortunately, about him <laughs> through his racing career. Um, every once in a while, he'd find him 
himself in front of a microphone, it wouldn't be detrimental to the horse. Um, but like different editorials, op-eds, the professionals in the industry, uh, when he was in the Triple Crown races, um, the stretch calls or the commentators after the race talking about and dissecting the race, you could pull so many of those quotes and we put them all on one page. So if the media was trying to write about them, they could reference that quotes and we'd never have to look anything up. And so our whole thought behind that with any horse is to just make it easier for them to be covered in the media and present all of that information there because they're top of mind to the writers and it really helps them to make their job a lot easier and then give you a lot more coverage. For Big Brown in particular, and these situations come up for everyone here and there in unique ways every time, we had to rebrand the horse when he got to Three Chimneys and we, we kept saying, I heard it a thousand times, he's leaving his baggage at the gate. The week before he got there, I think it was a week before he got there, his trainer had said something about him being on steroids. Um, the eight bells thing had happened, so PETA had already done two protests at the farm. Um, it, was, it was a really different triple crown season for us. Um, but so we were trying to rebrand the horse as a three chimneys horse, not as the chemical horse or the horse that pulled up in the Belmont or the horse that Rip Dutro trained or anything like that. Um, so that press pack, it was the first step in doing that. The next step in doing that was having an open house for the media. You guys, if you have stallion farms, I'm sure you have open houses for, it, not just for the media, but for the public as well. For Big Brown, we did one for the media and one for the public, but normally you can combine the two. Um, so if you have stallion farms, open houses are a great way to showcase your stallions. If you buy or sell race horses or sales horses or anything, that is a great time to go look at sires and confirmation and everything like that. Some people get a little bit apprehensive about doing open houses because you sometimes can get inundated with um, non-breeders and non-racing you know, racing professionals. It's a lot of fans. To me, then when I was up through chimneys, to all of us, it goes back to that whole being a good citizen of your community and we're all in the community of horse racing. So we embrace them. You know, if we got 100 fans for every two brooders, we educated them about we're more than welcome to have or we're more than happy to have you here and we'd love to show you the stallions we just need to give breeders first priority and so we made sure our breeders were never at a disadvantage because our open houses would be packed but we welcome fans that's a personal choice that any farm can make if you're going to advertise an open house in a publication like the tdn or one of the dailies you have to be prepared to get some fans um but I think it's a good thing. It's a great touchstone for people to have of the horse industry. They understand it better and they start getting more comfortable with it. And that might make them an owner down the road. Um, when we would do open houses, we'd publicize it with a media alert to the media. So they would run something about it. A media alert is just, excuse me, a more bare bones version of a press release. You know, it's not as paragraph conversational. It's just, the who, what, where, when, and why, and then maybe a, a paragraph at the bottom giving any ancillary details. So your open house is at this farm, at this day and time, these stallions will be shown, breeders are invited to attend, and then you can put in there if you're gonna be offering snacks or a giveaway or drinks or lunch, anything like that in that bottom paragraph. Um, you can also advertise it in daily publications are really good for doing that kind of thing and online publications are great. Your Facebook page is a great place to advertise um, your stallion open houses. And then just having enough people on hand to answer questions for everyone. I think that was the thing that we sometimes had a harder time with is that there weren't enough people to articulately answer all of the questions because a lot of times the grooms don't know the, the details about the breeding contracts and the deals for certain levels of mares or the two for ones or anything like that. So do you, just being sure that your staff is prepared with all of the information that you want to get out to the public when they come to be your, view your stallions. Um, the other thing about um, press releases and everything on the flip side of doing the media relations, obviously 
send press releases out when you have newsworthy events that you need to disseminate information on. But story pitching is another really good way to get information out there and drum up some activity and marketing for your, for your farm. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of that. Rec one of my clients is um, an agricultural um, like farm development and project management company called Karen and SRA. And they are a startup and they have, they're lucky they have a ton of business right away because they both are well-known entities um, in and of themselves. And when they came together to start this company, they had already had some big projects under their belt. But they were struggling to get the word out that they existed. And they did not have the budget to be doing a $20,000 marketing campaign. So we're sitting around um, having lunch, trying to think of cost-effective ways we can promote their business. And they just happened to mention something about the Man of War Barn that they refurbished the year before, two years before, maybe a little bit longer. And so I, that obviously caught my attention. Um, and I said, oh, tell me about that. And they said, oh, we refurbished the Man of War Barn at Mount Brilliant, where Man of War was born out there. Um, it used to be a different farm, but now it's called Mount Brilliant. And it was right around the time that it, this year was the 100th year anniversary of Man of War being born. And it was right around the time when they were doing um, a couple events around, I think March 17th may have been the day he was born. So they were doing some events around that. And we just happened to be talking about it a month later. And so I said, well, let me see if I could pitch some stories about this. And so the whole relationship with the media that we were talking about before, <laughs> you get to know the people on your media list and reach out to them periodically and just make sure they know you're there so that when stuff like that comes up, I could call the Thoroughbred Daily News. Um, I was gonna call the Blood Horse if the Thoroughbred Daily News wasn't interested in it, but they were more interested in the Thoroughbred Daily News, so I went with that one. Um, I called them, asked if they were interested. They were, they ended up doing like a big story on them, sending a photographer out, taking photos of them in the barn that they refurbished and doing something about Man of War and about them and it got their name out to the whole business. I also pitched it to our NBC affiliate in Lexington. It was the week, two weeks before the Derby, if I'm not mistaken. They were looking for anything Derby related to cover and they were, they were short on content. There weren't a lot of those like super touchy feely stories this year. So they were saving all of theirs for the week of the Derby and this gave them the perfect opportunity to do a story about the Derby two weeks out and save all of their really good stories for the week of. So they got a ton of content out there in the public that probably got them tens of thousands of dollars worth of advertising, but they only paid me a couple hundred bucks to make a couple calls and take a little bit of time to pitch and explain the story. So story pitching is key. Like Megan and these guys were talking about posting those photos and posting those videos and everything on Facebook, you can also periodically send those to the media. You never know when they just have space like in their magazine or in the daily publications especially. They have to do a layout every day and sometimes that layout just doesn't fit and they just need something to put in a space. If someone sends them a really cute or unique photo with a nice caption and you present three inches of content for them when they really need it, done. It's in there and you haven't paid anything. All you did was reach out to them and hand them the solution to their problem on a silver platter. So that's kind of my whole take on media relations. It's just trying to make it as easy as possible for someone to cover you. Um, let's see. Another thing she was asking me to talk about like other marketing stuff that we might not be covering in the other sections. Sponsorship is another thing that I thought might be a really key thing to think about. Um, I'm going to use another Three Chimneys example for this one. Um, for farms and things like that, race sponsorships are a great way to get your name out. Um, and you can do so much more than just what someone presents you in a sponsorship proposal. So if you reach out to a track or you reach out to TVG or you reach out to a publication and you say you're interested in sponsorship, it's good to have a budget in mind before you reach out to them. Um, and you can ask around, you can ask any of us. I'm sure we'd all be more than happy to share our email addresses and give you our opinions on it too if you're struggling to know what your budget should be. 
um, but knowing what your budget should be first, so that way they don't present you like a hundred and fifty thousand dollar sponsorship, and you're like, I was thinking forty five hundred dollars. Um, but so they will present you their sponsorship plan, and inevitably, I think you read through there and you find one or two things that really make it worth your money, and a couple other things that you just could not care less about. But they're part of your sponsorship, and most people in nine times out of ten are like, well, I want those one or two things, so I'll just go with it. Everything is a negotiation. Everything in PR and sponsorship and marketing, everything's a negotiation. Like you were saying about the advertising, sponsorship is too. The price of sponsorship is too, but the sponsorship benefits that you're getting are too. So by all means, have something in mind. If there's a goal you're trying to get out of that sponsorship, like let's say you want to host your clients on race day. You want to sponsor a race, have some signage up, host your clients on race day. See if you can trade in some of the benefits that aren't as interesting to you for something that will get you a little bit farther with what your end goal is. Um, I mean, I, when I was at Three Chimneys, um, when I was at Three Chimneys, we would sponsor the Saratoga Special and the Hopeful every year at, at Saratoga, obviously. And um, their sponsorship package was okay, but it didn't give you a lot of bang for your buck. And so I, we just were always very eager to work with them on that. We weren't as interested in, in certain ads in the track program because we had the ad on the back cover of the track program so we didn't care about having an ad in the track program that day um, there were a couple other things the um, the jumbotron in the middle of Saratoga's uh, infield it's better now but the sound used to be deplorable and no one was paying attention because there was no sound between races so we didn't really care about having our commercial run because no one could hear it so we asked if we could trade that in for the VIP hospitality suite that overlooked the winner's circle. So we could entertain all of the connections of all of the horses in those two races for the race day. They could pop in, pop out with all their friends, whatever, they could stay the whole day if they wanted to because those are stallion making races. Horses that run in those races, inevitably a couple of them will become stallions. And so we traded in so many of our other sponsorship opportunities because we, that was our focus for that sponsorship is to get a stallion out of that. Um, and we got two out of that. One never even ran in the races, but that's how we connected with Mike Rapoli to stand a horse of his and um, get a lot of other sales business as well. But so we traded that in. And the other thing we did was um, they gave us one sign on the, the finish line for the race. They'd put up signage on the finish line. If you watch the Indiana Derby tonight, I'm guessing that there will be a sponsor sign that's put up at the finish line and that's basically I love having signage there because anytime anyone writes about that horse that won the Indiana Derby the picture hopefully will include that sponsor but there's two things I was concerned about one the horse if it's like a free-for-all at the finish your signage gets covered and also it, it's just you can't do much with one sign so we asked if we could get rid of all of our other sponsorship benefits except for the hospitality suite and could we have five signs at the end of the finish mm -hmm. and we didn't care if they were after the finish line we just wanted five signs and saratoga just said sure no one had ever asked so they never had a reason to say no and until they have a reason to say no sure mm -hmm. and so we were doing this campaign that year called breed like you mean it um and so at the finish line in the the race that year, the sign said breed like you mean it, and every picture had that in there, it had our logo on it. And so we got so much traffic and footage, and like we got so much out of that. And so many people commented on it, NBC commented on it. So it's all about just kind of leveraging, deciding what you want to get out of a sponsorship, and then negotiating and leveraging and trying to get it. The other thing I'll say about sponsorship too is make sure you're getting what you're promised because tracks are so busy everyone's so busy you're so busy and i'm so busy they're not always paying attention to make sure you're getting everything you've been promised in your sponsorship um and that actually happened at saratoga as well and we got a massive discount on our sponsorship the next year because they failed to put our signage in the winner's circle and they failed to put our signage on the trees and the paddock and things like that so just having eyes on the ground and having someone who's there for no other reason 
than to make sure everything is being done the way it should be. If they're tasked with a million other things, they won't have time to really take it in and see what could be done better next year and what's not being done. Having someone that's protecting your brand and there to make sure everything is executed properly is worth whatever money it takes to get them there for a day. Um, and the only other thing that I was going to talk about that's also not like a public relations thing, but it kind of does tie in. When uh, Dennis was talking about advertising, actually all three of them have talked about like advertising and posting your ads on the web and posting your ads on social media. There's, if, if you're putting the money into paying for an advertisement, you want to make that ad work as hard as possible for you. So definitely cross promote. Use it in an email blast. In the same way I was talking about coming up with a press list, make sure you come up with um, a database of all your clients. Not just who's bred to your horses, but who's ever called to breed. Who's gone to your website and filled out a request for more information. If you do contests on your website, make them have to give you their information for those contests. And you build up a really valuable email database. That way you can do e-blasts. Same thing with direct mail. It doesn't cost a whole lot of money to do those like oversized postcards or something inexpensive. You can do that for 70 cents per probably. And that just makes your ad dollars go farther for you. If you're paying someone to create an ad and you've paid to put it somewhere, that just gets a lot more out of it. So that's about it. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. If you guys have anything to add, I'm sure I missed a ton of stuff. <coughs> you guys sent brownies when he, he had his first bowls too. We did. <laughs> yeah. When he had his first little brownies, yeah. we took brownies to all the media. I have a question. Um, we were talking about the situation we have in Indiana and how it's unusual and unique and so forth. When it comes to selling yearlings, it's just a challenge because you want to get the most you can get from your yearling. But you wanted to stay in Indiana to get your awards. Um, so advertising it nationally is sometimes counterproductive of the overall goal. Um, do you have any advice on not shooting yourself in the foot? <laughs> you know, Definitely. You want to get the most you can get, but then you would like for it to stay here. Is there any ideas of how we could go about presenting them in a way they would stay in Indiana? I think definitely having a direct mail piece or an email piece that you can send out to all of your Indiana database, having an Indiana data database that you've created will let you disseminate that information. Um, but I also think it's really valuable to take advantage of some of the ad deals that like the Blood Horse or the TDN have for consigners or for anyone who's not a major stallion farm basically. Um, if you call them, they'll do like a $350 ad that's a full page ad a lot of times for consigners or for smaller entities. And educating people about the benefits of buying and racing an Indiana bread in Indiana because a lot of times like you said and like you said it's so unique people don't know so educating them about that so even if someone outside of Kentucky buys it they still it starts getting the wheels spinning about why they should consider sending it to Indiana rather than maybe sending it to Gulfstream. Yeah, <laughs> Did that not work? And as the commission, we are going, we're working to put together and discuss something we were going to talk about um, at the end of the seminar and getting your guys' input on what you want us to help you educate your breeders and your buyers about the program and how you know to best reap those rewards. You know we. Our, our, um, our direction right now that we're looking at doing is promoting the regional, you know, that the regional programs. We had, there was a meeting a couple weeks ago, and so we, you know, was mentioned that, you know, our regional program is very lucrative. Um, maybe not nationally, but regionally it is, and that's kind of where you want, where our readers want to aim 
their business towards. So um, we are going to work to put together some pamphlets to give to all of our readers to help them educate their customers and their clients in order to help them learn the benefits of being in Indiana and being part of the program and coming back and breeding and coming back and racing and that sort of thing. So we know it's we know it's a really hard it's a really it's a really delicate balance for Indiana breeders, but we also want everybody to also look at the big picture for expanding the business and expanding your um, your farm. Another thing that you can think about and I've had people do this for my current consigner clients and also when I was at Through Chimneys, if they have a horse that they feel like the potential buyers might be missing a point, you can have printed materials made and put out at that consigner's uh, area or have signage made that they can put on that pony wall at Keeneland or you know wherever the horse is being shown at the other sales that promotes the points you're trying to get across. And you can also make sure that um, you can talk with whoever the consigner is to make sure that key points are made as that horse is entering the ring by the announcer. They can give the announcers notes to make sure that they hit on A, B, and C as they're introducing that horse into the ring. And that all just kind of helps in that, you know, someone who wasn't even on the horse might hear something like that and it might resonate with the client they have or with themselves and it, it might make the difference in a few thousand dollars. And I know you guys always keep up with your yearlings and two-year-olds as they're sold. Don't be afraid to reach out to the owners too. Um, mm -hmm. If you see your horses running in Kentucky, you know, call them up and say, hey, you know, I'm glad your horse is doing well. You know, um, just wanted to make sure you're aware that there's a, you know, stallion stakes later this year or a Indiana bred race and, you know, might be a good, good spot for them because you'd be surprised sometimes that people are just focused on racing wherever they are and they may not know about, uh, you know, some of the opportunities to race up here. And if, if you remind them that, helps them keep it in mind. That's such a good point, and that's free. Yeah. There's also Facebook. If you have a page, you can go into the marketing program for Facebook, and you can get very specific about who you want to reach and what areas. You can, you can do it in a state or a city or a zip code, and your ad will just go around to those. And I just wanted to touch on one other thing that, that you said that has worked real well in Texas and I think would work really well up here too and no matter what you've read on the internet newspapers still <laughs> exist um, <laughs> and so do a lot of these little horse publications that um, you know you see at tax stores and, and gas stations and stuff and like Jen said all those people that are working there don't have enough staff they don't have enough money um, and there's a lot of small town newspapers, the city newspapers, county newspapers. If you make contact with these people and make it easy for them to run a story, I can almost guarantee you they will. Um, especially if you have um, a photo to go with it. Talk to Tammy Knox here, she is awesome. Um, and it doesn't have to be a, a press release about you winning the Kentucky Derby or the Indiana Derby. If you have a horse that was bred and grew up here, um, talk to your county newspaper. When he wins a race, it doesn't matter if it's a maiden claiming race, get a photo from Tammy. Um, she'll be happy to give you one. Write up a little story. Um, and it doesn't have to be super professionally done. Get a full photo of your horse if you have it. And if you send a little news release to your local paper that says that this foal that was raised here right outside of town won a race at Indiana Grand and, and you have a photo of him as a foal, a photo of him winning the race, a quote or two, most of the time you'd be surprised that, that they'll pick it up and they'll run it and they'll use that photo because they're always looking for content and they're especially looking for prepackaged content that's already done and yeah. that they don't have to worry about digging stuff up like that. And people love um, photos, they love uh, full photos. So anything you can do to send out with that press release Send two or three photos. They may not use them all, but send out um, something that's eye-catching and, and, and unique, like like Chad was talking about. The standard photo is great, but then send something that's fun or different, and, and maybe they'll use that. Because I love getting stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, and I may put it in the magazine. Maybe it just goes up on the mm -hmm. website, but at least it gets out there and people are going to read it. Yeah, and it doesn't even have to be about like something super racing significant. If you're hosting the local 4-H or FFA or Pony Club out at your farm to 
introduce them to what a thoroughbred farm is like or something like that. Take a photo or two of the group, you know, in front of your sign or with one of your horses and do the same thing. Send that to the thoroughbred media. They might run it if it's a slow news day, but also the local press. They love that kind of stuff. So it doesn't have to be something super newsworthy. It can be like the feel good stuff. Any picture with kids too. Mm -hmm. they, the kids and foals almost always get picked up. Along those same lines, how important do you think it is for the, you know, the broader picture of our industry that farms be involved community wise in, you know, spreading awareness of our sport and trying to cultivate people? I know a lot of times that everybody kind of gets in their own little niche of doing things and it's very easy just to stay on the farm and not get involved with 4-H like you just said or those type of things. So how important do you think that is? I personally think it's huge. I, I feel like, please, if someone disagrees with this, don't shoot me for saying it. I feel like uh, in some ways the leaders of our industry have really failed the industry by not focusing on that enough or getting too caught in the very necessary weeds of some of the other issues the industry is facing. And so that's the whole thing I was talking about earlier with being a good citizen of your community. Be a good citizen of your thoroughbred community and represent the community in positive ways whenever you can. I, I think that's hugely important. It's a function of PR too. So in helping the industry, you're also helping yourself because you're positioning yourself as a farm that is open and forthcoming and a leader in its field. Yeah, and that's, you know, just to piggyback on that, you know, that's not just the thoroughbred or the racing industry, that's horse industry in general. You know, I think we failed, you know, the forefathers of us have failed as far as promoting that. You know, we kind of get stuck in our own little niches, we kind of do what we do and, and, you know, stay to ourselves. But this, this especially is a fan-based industry. Mm -hmm. You know, if we lose our fans, we lose our industry. And we're seeing loss of fans, which, um, which is a problem. Um, in non-racing industry, we there's initiative called Time to Ride, um, mm -hmm. which is trying to bring people back into the industry, new people into the industry, young people, open up farms, you know, do farm tours to everybody, to you know, non-horse people, and get more people into the horse industry. Uh, and I think something like that would definitely be useful for the thoroughbred and for the racing industry. Um, but it takes takes the group to to get it done and to push that forward. It's tough in Indiana too, because I, in Lexington, I mean, it's not all Debbie Downer, I promise I'm all for a lot of the initiatives that are going on. In Lexington, they have an initiative called Horse Country um, that because all of the farms are in such close geographic proximity to one another, they've set up this tour uh, company that will take people on tours of all of the farms. It's probably harder to do in a place like Indiana where it's so spread out, but if you're local community is having their annual whatever day, their annual festival, their annual this or that, you can talk with the Chamber of Commerce if you want to be engaged in the community and see if they want to offer several farm tours where people can get on you know, a tour van or something, tour bus, sign up for tours, come out to your farm, and you can present the horse industry to them from their perspective and give them a really positive experience with thoroughbred racing. And it's great PR for you because then you can post on your Facebook page that you've done that. You can send out a press release to the national press that you've done that. You can post it on your website and then get more turnover of content. There's so much you can do for yourself because you're doing it, but you're also doing it on behalf of the industry. And doing something like that is really important as well because if you reach out especially to your local legislators, your local politicians, your mayors, your state representatives, and you know, welcome them to your farm, that really helps. And you know, a lot of the stuff, you know, the commission, you know, we are a state state group and a lot of the things that we do have to get passed in the state house and to have to invite you know your legislator to invite your your you know state representative, state senator, mayor, town council, whomever, anybody that's in the area, you know, to say, hey, please come, learn what we're about, learn what we're doing for not only the state of Indiana but our community, and that kind of thing, that really that really helps as well, and they kind of you create friendships and 
um, who creates, you know, kind of like a partner or somebody that's going to hopefully support you in the state house. I know our executive director is very, very big on that and very big on on you know, a lot of things that we try to get passed through the through the state. So if you are open with our with your government officials and everything, that also helps, and it helps with. You know, helping with development. If you're in an area that's starting to become very developed and farmland's going, that's a really big thing that we battle with a lot in Indiana right now. And so it's just kind of some of those things that you know we need our our farm owners to stand up and kind of help support as well. Well, and I think it helps to establish that relationship before yes. there is a problem. Yes. Before there's some bill that's been introduced by somebody that's going to have a detrimental effect on your farm or your business, if you already had that relationship when you're calling up that legislator, you know, it's not the first time they're hearing from you. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not only hearing from you when they're a problem, they're hearing from the good stuff too. You know, you can establish that relationship so they know who you are before an issue comes up. Hopefully there's no issues. But <laughs> But it's good to have that relationship before it happens, before it's needed. Mm -hmm. So this is the one that kind of Yeah. Yeah. And I like to say too, you know, if you want to have, you know, a Chamber of Commerce farm tours and you need some talking points about our industry, contact us. You know, we're available. I'll come out. Sarah will come out. Um, Megan, I'll come out. Megan, one <laughs> of us will, you know, we'll make sure that we can get somebody out there to help you guys do that. So, and provide the information here. Mike will come out. I'll volunteer Mike. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are going to do any kind of farm tour, um, have something to give to the people when they leave. Give them a flyer, um, give them a little <laughs> stress horse or something like that. Because if you've ever been here when they do the t shirt toss here, there's people almost killing each other. <laughs> to, I'm serious, to get a free t shirt. It's amazing. It's like there's some massive t-shirt shortage <laughs> going on <laughs> but when you give away that stuff even if it's just a hat and it just it doesn't have to be expensive um, when people walk away with something like that after going to your farm tour they're going to remember it um, you know other people might see it and say hey where'd you get that cool horse racing hat and then they'll they'll tell them about your farm so um, you don't have to spend a lot of money but to have something to to give to the people um, even if they're not going to do business with you even if they're just it might be a 4-h group and they're never going to bring them air out there to, to breathe your stallion, but they can still help you advertise just by you giving them some free stuff that they're going to take out into the public. I do have one quick note. Um, you do have, you know, invite the community out and if you do take photos, especially of children, and you, with the intention of possibly using it for um, advertising or sending it to publications, make sure you speak with the parents and get their, um, get their okay. If, Say, you know, we might be putting this on our Facebook page, we might be sharing this. I just say this as a former photo <laughs> editor in a past life. Um, you know, make sure you get that because you don't want to get a phone call from a bad parent to be like, I really didn't want my kid to be on the front page of the Shelbyville Times, <laughs> you know, because blah, 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 blah. You know, you don't want that. So if you're going to do that, I, it's great. I'm not discouraging you, but just know when you take it, just say, we're going to post this on our Facebook page, or we're going to do, you know, we're, you know, thinking of sending this to so and so if that's all right. And then that way, if a parent says, I'm not comfortable with my kid being in an ad, or I'm not comfortable with my kids, then they'll, you know, they'll let you know. You, you know, that's one of those where you need to ask permission instead of, you know, apologizing. Uh, but I had, I found an article the other day, I was doing a little bit more research, and I found an article that I thought was really great, and I didn't know if anybody was going to touch base on some of the stuff, about some different other marketing um, schemes and other, schemes not really, <laughs> different marketing Pyramids. plans that, um, you know, some, some farms are doing, you know, mostly, mostly in Kentucky, but it just kind of gives you guys some different ideas. Um, Natalie Boss actually wrote it for um, Pollock Report um, a few years ago, but it still holds true. And, um, you know, she taught, she says, um, as mirror owners browse more than 2,000 thoroughbred stallions looking for that perfect match, stallion farms have become more creative on how they retract and keep their clients' attention. 
Um, most plant breeders say a hot young stallion generates enough buzz in its first couple of years at stud to fill his books, but by year three or four, however, most of the buzzing has moved on to flush fresh blood, and a lower to mid-level young horse has difficulty attracting the ladies. To combat this problem, farms have implemented marketing techniques to get their horses noticed at minimal cost. They have launched breeding incentive programs to keep mares coming back to their breeding sheds. Advertising has moved away from the expense of using full-page print ads and for direct or lower cost alternatives. One stallion on a limited marketing budget is Wintergreen Stallion Station's new sire, Bullet Train, who is a three-quarter brother to Franklin. At the Keeneland January sale, we were handing out envelopes to buyers and mares that nicked well with him, said Sean Feld, head of marketing and sales for Bullet Train. We're trying to not spend an obscene amount of money. What we did at the sale was relatively inexpensive and generated some buzz. And there are programs like True Knits and um, I think e that you can do that stuff and you can do a little bit of that research for your stallion that I really recommend you checking out. Um, others have upped their participation in social media, fell launched Twitter and Facebook accounts for Bolt Train in an attempt to reach an increasing number of breeders using the platform. I want to be more interactive. Bullet Train has fans worldwide, said Feld. I probably know about 10 breeders that are on Twitter, and I'm hoping that in the next couple of years it'll turn into a thousand breeders. Right now, Facebook is more likely to get the seasons sold. Taylor Made Farm prefers direct marketing, according to the stallion nomination manager Travis White. Farm, also known for its sizable sales division, maintains a detailed database with contact information and buying activity for its customers <coughs> and sends emails and print materials straight to its target audience. This month, Darley launched an eBay style auction called Bid for Glory, or also referred to as Ene, for seasons in Magdoria Doro, Long 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 that was a 3 we came up with the same idea with even the same name. Oh. And then we and decided it is still the auction is open to any breeder with a mare under the age of 18 at least one live bull. Once breeders attract the attention of mare owners, many offer incentive programs to keep stallions books full as their first two years of stud. Spencer created a first program designed to save off this drop in business with a share of the upside. Readers looking to a new stallion for two years could pay a fee that guaranteed them future lifetime breeding rights. Those rights could be sold by the breeder. Um, and it just kind of goes on if you want to read more of it. But they talk about, and I know Golden Springs Farm does a breeder's incentive. Um, it, and all that, yep, you know, you got that that kind of stuff and just kind of, it's kind of like loyalty cards. You go to Kroger and you get, you know, you get discounts because you're using a loyalty card. It's kind of the same thing. You want to create that loyalty base and, you know, we want to create that loyalty base for our Indiana breeders and, our, and you know, get more attention in that way. So it's just kind of about thinking outside of the box. And some things, if it doesn't work, oh well, it's cheap, you move on to the next thing. Yeah, it's one of the best things about digital stuff. It's cheap and easy to fix. You know, other stuff that might not be very cheap, but at least you gotta try it and see what works best for you guys. Not every advertising um, idea is going to work for everybody. It's not cookie cutter and it's not gonna be something that, you know, it's gonna work for Swifty, for Holden Farms, for Windstar, that kind of thing. I know we don't have you know, there's nobody has the budget of Windstar. I would wish I had a quarter of a budget of Windstar. Um, <laughs> wish I had their you know, landscaping budget. There's a little stuff that you guys have to do. Is there any other questions or concerns? We have a lot of time left if anybody wants to, you know, share any, you know, issues that you're having or, you know, if you have any any questions or even if you want to bounce ideas off of our presenters, <coughs> you're more than welcome to. Okay. Uh, one comment about, and about your article, and uh -huh. I do some of the work for some of those clients that uh, you referenced there. But as I look through your staying directory, which you know, has a lot of kind of new horses in there that, you know, could, you know, if you're a breeder, and I, when I'm not working on horses as a veterinarian, I'm breeding my own mares. Um, 
but your idea about the Enix platform for, especially in reference to your comment about websites, you have stains. Mm -hmm. um, so I do the work at Crestwood Farm and at Bullet Train. And so one of the really neat interfaces that I think that website has that is so key if you're a press person who's busy with the mayor and you're trying to figure out who to bring them to is that Enix platform that they have developed there where you can put your mayor's name in and it brings up all this information on all the signs that stand there and which ones might fit. And then they time the incentive programs like Megan referenced um, to, and, and several farms do this, but I tell you it's a really effective marketing tool for third year horses especially that are struggling to fill books to keep vendors going uh, and to have repeat customers and so uh, what's the saying there like get stormy right now we're starting to have a really good year they use that very effectively to rebuild that horse's book because it was dropping off considerably in february and then he jumped up with a pretty sizable book and then it has a really nice progeny kind of back to that and the uh, enix platform was pointed out to me actually by several of my clients that had gone there and bred back to that horse this year because they found that to be so useful. And that's a really good one. Those share the upside things, I just would, this is a cautionary footnote to what's going on in Kentucky right now, <laughs> is that sounds really good, but it is a way to upsell a lot of breeders when you suddenly sell your horse overseas. Yeah. And that, I have a lot of clients that are pretty shook up over that situation. Yeah. And it's, uh, it things all well and good if you know you know you're committed to keeping your staying there forever and stuff, but I think you have to be careful about it being your leading marketing thing because it causes some people to fracture relationships and don't want to go back. And I think that's a, that's a little sad in this industry really. Yeah, especially well, that's with Archer Church. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm good friends with Val. Uh -huh. So, yeah. yeah. Like she had just brought me her three year old who's by our charge out of the yeah. King Mambo mare. And the only reason she gave her to me was because she was breeding to him and then now it's going to Korea and she's, <laughs> I mean, anybody seen her so on Facebook, she's yeah. very upset because yeah. she offered to stand him in Arkansas. Yeah. And they were like, no. Yeah. And she has the contracts and everything and he's like, oh well. And that just, and that just, yeah. that disenfranchises a, a group of breeders that this industry doesn't need to have disenfranchised because we, we depend on it. Business oh, yeah, and right. building and growing the business, and you all have a great program here. You know, I'd say this is a Kentucky breeder, but it's somebody who's you know, race horses as well. And then talking to the folks at Churchill Downs and at other places in Kentucky that ship here and come here, and you can actually put pressure on those tracks for people that leave there to run here and try to, you know, going back. But you, you've got some great programs, and I have several clients who participate in the Indiana Bread Program at Maris Bowl here. Burger. You can go up and pick something from from there. That's gonna be your head. Dude, I'm gonna have to do that. 
Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Always good. <laughs> uh, now I just have to make sure I get it. I I'll have to come one. I'll put one of your names. Sandra Walter. <laughs> and Chrissy Francis. So then now we will, everybody will, um, everybody's name will be pulled in. This will be for the full page at American Resource. We can talk with them about it after this. Yeah, we're tired. So. Sent her a couple, but yeah, take. Make sure, yeah, did you all already? Make sure that yeah, you it's one of those that I know people always ask me to send it, and then and half the time I forget. <laughs> so yeah, go ahead. I'll and just do it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Pretty good too. I have to. I had to move out of my office because it was just like eating. I love fortune cookies. So that means that we have an avenue for press releases. There is a pamphlet on building press releases. I appreciate Jen kind of going through the you know the backbones of what a press release is. That's very helpful. Feel free to take that information and you know talk with us so we can help you out with that as well. Um, there's tons of free stuff on the on the table back here for everybody. Magazines, pamphlets, pens, give you great ideas for advertising your own stuff, especially at the Ichova sales or you know at any other sales like that. Um, and eat food. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lady, when you get your handouts ready, I have eight. In the Keeneland sale. Great. Fiber Indiana bread. In September sale? Yes. In, okay. I'd like something to hand out, you know, to say just the bullet points of why they should bring the horse back here yeah. if at all possible. Great. Well, let's talk about A lot of times it's pin hookers you buy and then, yeah. you know, but that also is something they can turn around and hand out when they're going to the next sale. Exactly. Something exactly. along the lines of pace or Yes, yes. And then, of course, I'm going to do my Kids Springs bonus that I'll pay $1,000 for a much away or a little extra 2500 for stakes if they've been here in the state. That's awesome. That's great. Uh, I'm paying part of my breeder's words back. You'll come back here. <laughs> <laughs> no, Korea. No, Korea. And that horse went over there, went alive. And another one went to Mexico as a three-year-old in June when I pulled it. She had already won three races in Mexico. 